Hello everybody, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Community and R Rural and Community Development to the 2023 National Social Enterprise Conference. My name is Sean Darcy and this is Tammy Darcy. So for those of you that don't know Sean Darcy, he is the manager of Renew and Renew is a social enterprise that's based in the heart of Waterford City that strives to provide supportive employment to people who've been engaged in the criminal justice system. And Tammy is the founder and CEO of the Shona Project, a multi-award winning organisation that has empowered and educated hundreds of thousands of young women all throughout Ireland. So as you can probably tell, we are related. I am obviously Sean's slightly older sister. <laughs> hey! <Yeah. laughs> and as you can probably tell, uh, yeah, my mother is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> But yeah, social enterprise is definitely in our blood and very often the conversation topic over dinner in our house. So we're absolutely honoured to have been invited to play a small part in today's event. So we hope that you take today as an opportunity to not just be part of the national conversation about social enterprise, but also just as a chance to unhook yourselves from the day-to-day -day grind of running social enterprises and supporting social enterprises. Um, and we hope that you'll also connect with some old friends. As well as making some new ones. But for now, we thought it'd be nice for us all to just take a breath and take the time to ground ourselves in the room. So just for a moment, we thought it'd be nice if we all just had a little reset moment. And for those of you that put your, that have your phones in your hands, maybe put them down. Thank you, Siobhan. Those of you that have your laptops open, maybe close them for a minute. You can run payroll later. Um, and that includes those that are home or who are watching from your office. So what we thought we'd do is everybody, ask everybody to just close your eyes and take a nice big Better? <laughs> better. Okay. I definitely feel better. So um, the team of today is Social Enterprise in Ireland and an international perspective. Mm. We're all so proud of the sector that we've collectively built here in Ireland and its contribution to Ireland's social and environmental future. But there is so much that can be learned from our colleagues internationally. Let's get the housekeeping out of the way first. So we are supported here by the team from Social Enterprise Republic of Ireland, the Surrey team. So if we could get everyone from Surrey to raise your hands. Mm. Yeah, if you have a problem, ask these people. <laughs> and if you need anything from any one of us throughout the day, uh, just please ask. We're all here to help. In the event of a fire, there is so many emergency exits. There's here, 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 here and here. Um, so if you all maybe make your way out this way if possible and we can gather outside. Three other really quick things we need to talk about. So the hashtag for today's conference is Sock and IRL. No, you got to say the hashtag. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> hashtag Sock and IRL. And we encourage everyone to use this hashtag when posting on social media. I am ancient. Sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> and for those who are watching remotely, we really want to hear from you too. So please get involved in the conversation as much as you can. Yeah. For those in the room, you'll see three QR codes on your table. Using your phone, you can use these QR codes to access the conference agenda, biographies of speakers, and the conference WhatsApp group, which you can use to ask questions and start conversations. You'll also see on your desk there's a list of 12 exhibitors and the benefits of engaging with each of them throughout today. We encourage you to have a read of that and pick at least one exhibitor to go and talk to uh, during the break times and find out how they can support your organisation and make it your business to go and have a chat. Mm. As good a place to start as any, uh, is to centre the work that we all do on a daily basis within the national context and to connect with the growth and opportunities within the wider social enterprise sector. As you all know, uh, social enterprise sits within the remit of the Department of Rural and Community Development. Now, unfortunately, Minister he Heather Humphreys has a ministerial engagement today, which means she isn't able to attend in person, but she did ask us to share this welcome video with you all. Roll it there, Roisin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 5th National Social Enterprise Conference. Unfortunately, I can't be with you in person today in Ballinasloe, but I wanted to send you a brief message to wish you well during what I know will be an extremely busy day. This conference is a unique event in our social enterprise calendar and falls on International Social Enterprise Day. So this is an opportunity for you all to engage with each other, to network and to share ideas ideas and experiences. I'm pleased to confirm that we are at the final stages in the development of what will be Ireland's second national social enterprise policy. My department has been leading and driving this process forward. On that basis, we have been engaging with the sector and its representative groups, including many of you here today, as well as our colleagues across government. 
You will hear more later this morning about what has emerged from our stakeholder consultations, as well as our plans to provide a further avenue for any final contributions to the development of this important policy. My intention thereafter would be to complete and publish the new policy in the first quarter of next year. Our theme for today's conference is Social Enterprise in Ireland, an international perspective. This is appropriate as we reflect on the findings of a root and branch review of social enterprise in Ireland, which we will launch here today and which my colleagues in the OECD will shortly present to you. Last year, I asked the OECD to undertake this independent review in order to inform the development of our new policy. I would like to welcome the entire OECD team to Ballinasloe and say a special word of thanks both for their work and for the constructive way in which they engaged throughout. Before I conclude, I just want to say I'm very proud as Minister of the work you all do. You are the lifeblood of so many of our communities and I am excited to see what the future holes. I would like to also take this opportunity to acknowledge the social enterprise team in my department who are always available to support you in whatever way they can. I hope you all enjoy today and get plenty out of the conference and I look forward to meeting you soon again. Thank you so much. So it is my pleasure to introduce your first speaker this morning, Mary Hurley. Mary is the Secretary General of the Department of Rural and Community Development, and she is going to introduce the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mary Hurley. Thank you, Tammy, and thank you, Sean, and good morning, everybody. And when I came in here initially, I said, wow, that's a big room. But actually, we've filled the room. So it's great to see so many people here this morning. And I just want to welcome you all. Um, the minister, I was speaking to her on the way down, and she has, um, like all ministers, busy at ministerial engagements this morning. But she did say to me um, she had a very good event last year, and she's looking forward to hearing the outcome of today and to, to hear from, from Rob from Finton and the team, the kind of discussions we've had, and from uh, our OECD colleagues. So it's my pleasure, as I say, to be here with you all today. Social enterprise, so important, and I'm delighted to see so many of you who deliver social enterprise and who are engaged with social enterprise every day of this week. I'd like to thank initially our colleagues in Siri, the Social Enterprise Republic of Ireland, for all their work which has gone into organising this conference. And we heard from the minister there also. I want to thank my own team. There's been a flurry of activity in the department over the last number of weeks. And also, I suppose, with, with all the work that's going into the social enterprise policy, um, lots of activity. So thank you to my own team, as well as Social Enterprise Republic of Ireland um, for today. Most of all, I want to thank you who run social enterprises. Great to see you guys. And the breadth of attendees is why we wanted to bring a real strong diversity of social enterprises and a mix of both policy and practice to today. We heard from the minister there a moment ago, and we heard she referred to the Social Enterprise in Ireland baseline data collection exercise, which was published by the department in May. It's a hugely important document and information as it does provide us with a baseline evidence um, in terms of where we need to go, and it supports, I suppose, the activity of the sector. So huge amount of data there and a hugely important piece of work. We now have a really better picture of the areas in which social enterprises operate. We know they employ almost 85,000 people, so a huge amount of employment. A further estimated 75,000 estimated in the sector, including 45,000 active volunteers and 30,000 board members. We know that in 2021, social enterprise made a significant contribution to the Irish economy, with a total income of over 2.3 billion. Like Minister Humphreys, I want to, th to thank all the social enterprise and networks who participated in the survey because as we know, surveys are no use unless those who have an investment in the area take part. So it was really useful to get the information from you guys. 
Later this morning, we'll see Practice in Action, where three emerging social enterprises, No Barriers, Fibrest, and BIA Innovator Campus will give us insights into their ventures. We'll also have two panels where social enterprises, their representative organisations and policymakers discuss themes of real interest to the sector. In the afternoon, CBRE will present on corporate social procurement, which will consider both the opportunities and challenges for corporates and social enterprises in increasing market access and traded income. We'll also have breakout sessions. Uh, which, which will deal with topics such as philanthropy for social enterprise, climate action and social enterprise, and building an effective board. More importantly today is an opportunity for you all to network, and there'll be plenty of times to catch up with people, and the coffee is good, so we look forward to the breaks where we can all engage. I'd like to extend a particular welcome uh, to our colleagues from the OECD who are joining us now for the launch of their report into social enterprise policy implementation in Ireland. Entitled Boosting Social Entrepreneurship and Social Enterprise Development in Ireland, this report is the culmination of months of hard work between the OECD and the Department of Rural and Community Development. In a moment, I'll hand over to the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, Yoshiki, Taki Ochi, who is joining us online for his opening remarks. In the room, we have Amel and Melis, who are here from the OECD's Unit on Social Economy and Innovation at the Centre for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. Welcome to you, and we look forward to hearing from you. You'll be providing us with an in-depth look at the key report findings later in this session, and we're all very interested to hear about that. Thank you for your work in this area. I'd also like to represent those from the spectrum, wide spectrum of social enterprise, uh, enterprises, including colleagues from the Wheel and ISEN. We have attendance, attendees from our public funded bodies, the development sector and social funders. Mostly, we want to I want to welcome all of you people here today, and I look forward to the engagement today and to uh, hearing the discussion. And I am now going to hand over to the uh, to, to the Secretary, Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Minister Huntley, Secretary General Harry, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to join you for this National Social Enterprise Conference to launch the OECD Review on Social Enterprises in Ireland. The social economy and social enterprises are gaining traction. Policy makers around the world are increasingly looking to the social economy, including the social enterprises, to inspire and deliver new business models that are more sustainable and inclusive. We have seen how high this has grown on political agenda. For example, last year, the OECD adopted a recommendation on the social and solidarity economy and social innovation. And the United Nations, the ILO, and the EU have all, all these three adopted resolutions highlighting its important role in shaping a better future. These initiatives recognize that social economy is already a significant force. Across the European Union, it is estimated to contribute to around 6 to 8 percent of GDP, 10 percent of all businesses, and 6.3 percent of the working population. And here in Ireland, there is already a vibrant community of over 4,000 social enterprises active across many sectors, such as care, education, community, infrastructure, culture, and creative industries. It is having a huge impact on generating income. Of 2.34 billion, 2.34 billion euros, and providing jobs for 3.7 percent of the Irish workforce, more than two thirds of which are women. This is an extraordinary platform to build on, but there is a potential for much more from this sector. Potential which the Irish government is already making great strides to unlock. 
In 2019, Ireland launched the National Social Enterprise Policy for 2019 to 2022. This policy sets the framework for the sector's future growth by providing a working definition and identifying key areas of action. This includes access to finance, public and private markets, and business support. The Irish government has also sought to ensure the social enterprises to play an active role in delivering key initiatives. One example is our rural future, which recognizes their role in promoting the sustainable development of rural communities by developing local assets, driving innovation, and filling gaps in markets. Working to Change is another inspirational Irish strategy that leverages social enterprises to support people with criminal convictions through employment, business development, and mentoring activities. Social enterprises will help Ireland move towards a zero waste future as set out in the Waste Action, waste action Plan for a Circular Economy by delivering business to business waste management services, renewable energy, and circular economy solutions. And you have again looked to social enterprises to help Ireland achieve a 51% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions between 2021 and 2030 as part of the program for government and the National Energy Climate Plan. I am confident the, o uh, the OECD review we are launching today will help Ireland to develop an ambitious new national policy for social enterprises. One that will build on this progress and enable the sectors to go from strength to strength. Let me highlight a few key recommendations from our report. First, implementing legal labeling and improving data collection. Labels help consumers, funders, and authorities to identify social enterprises and prioritize them for their purchases, investment, and procurement. Here, Ireland could take inspiration from the UK, where community interest companies, which are companies whose ob objectives are primarily social, or from France, Solidarity Enterprise of Social Utility Label. Stronger legal labeling will also enable the collection of reliable official statistics and data, an area where Ireland has already made great progress through the data published earlier this year. The OECD encourages you to continue down this path and perhaps draw inspiration from countries such as Portugal, which launched a satellite account for the social economy in 2023. This will pave the way to further understand its reach and impact. Second key message, boosting access to markets, funding, and financial support. Social enterprises must be able to access the right funding and finance to start and scale up. To do this, Ireland could consider making public procurement processes more accessible by setting targets for social procurement as in Brisbane City Council, Australia, or by breaking down tenders into smaller lots that can be delivered by smaller social scale, uh, small, smaller scale social enterprises. Measures could be taken to promote philanthropy or to invest in incubators that support social enterprises to secure investment. And the government could also consider establishing a task force coordinated by the Department of Rural and Community Development to bring together the social enterprise eco ecosystem, the public sector, sector, and the banking sector. This could help raise awareness around the dual purpose of social enterprises, promote impact investment, and tackle the barriers they face in uh, raising finance. The third uh, key recommendation is we recommend strengthening social impact measurement. Customers, investors, and public authorities need to see evidence of impact from social enterprises to justify their support. Ireland need to build capacity to assess social impact and can draw inspiration from the 2023 OECD Policy Guide on Social Impact Measurement for the Social and Solidarity Economy, which provides a checklist for action and examples for best practices. So ladies and gentlemen, the social enterprises are having real impact. 
They are creating jobs and driving better outcomes by engaging youth, promoting gender equality, supporting the work integration of disadvantaged people, improving the local environment, and reducing emissions. For over 25 years, the OECD has been supporting national, regional, and local governments in designing and implementing strategies to unlock the potential of the social economy. So we are delighted to have Partner Guzalan to share this experience with you and look forward to coming back in the future to learn about the new initiatives you implement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Mr. Takeuchi and also Secretary General of the Department of uh, Rural and Community Development, Mary Hurley, for your contributions. Um, to share more details on this groundbreaking OECD report, I'd like to welcome two representatives from the OECD, Amal Chavro and Melise Aslan. And there will be 10 minutes then as well afterwards for a Q&A for any questions on how this report might, might affect our day-to-day -day work in social enterprise. And I'd also like to encourage those at home to please WhatsApp any questions you might have. This is a good opportunity to ask those questions, all right? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. As you can see, this is a double act. <laughs> so it's Melis, my, my, my uh, partner in, in drafting this uh, great report, and myself, who will have the pleasure and the honor to be with you this morning. So thank you very much for being uh, here and for coming to listen to uh, the launch of this report. I would like to start also by thanking my colleagues from uh, the Department of Rural Development and Community Development as well for all their support and um, their collaboration throughout the, the, the process. So um, as we heard from the, the Deputy Secretary General, we are pleased to be here to launch this review and to celebrate social enterprises in Ireland, but also throughout the world. As you know, today is Social Enterprise World Day, so congratulations to you all for the work you're doing and for the, the great efforts that we have seen here in, in, in Ireland in helping you strive, in helping you develop, in, have, in helping you grow and scale. So uh, without further ado, I will start by uh, giving you a uh, few details about the, the report, and then Melis will take over at some point to um, develop other parts. So, the, if I can have the presentation up. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, so um, again, we are very pleased to um, launch this report, and it's called Boosting Social Entrepreneurship and Social Enterprise Development in Ireland. It's what we call in OECD an in-depth policy review. So what's an in-depth policy review? Before I dive in, uh, what you can find in the review. It's an exercise whereby we meet with the stakeholders, which we did, and we try to learn as much as possible on the the, the good things that happen in a country with regard to certain policy and a certain sector, but also where there is room for improvement. So um, this report provides you, as you can see, <coughs> uh, the review of what we call the ecosystem. And this review is built on the, uh, or follows the OECD recommendation on the social and solidarity economy and social innovation that was adopted last year in uh, June 2022. And this standard or document has nine pillars by which we uh, assess and evaluate whether the, 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 a certain policy or a certain sector is going to the right direction, if I may say. So, Without further ado, which you can find in the report that's going to be live, I think, in, if it's not already live on, through social media, uh, you will find a review of all these pillars. <clears throat> Sorry, the institutional and legal frameworks regarding social uh, enterprises in, in Ireland, access to funding and access to finance, access to private and uh, public markets, social impact measurement and data, and we've he heard a lot about that already, and skills and business development. So, 
Before we dive into the different um, uh, recommendations and the action plan that's set in the, in the review, I would like just to highlight that, uh, and we've heard that already, that you as social enterprises contribute already a lot to economic growth and sustainable development here in, in Ireland. And you do that through different pathways. As you know, and we know now, uh, social enterprises in Ireland contribute, have different pathways, as I said, they contribute to different um, important and strategic sectors and streams of work, such as the provision of welfare services. We know from the data exercise that you've conducted that at 68% of social enterprises here in Ireland are concentrated in essential services such as childcare, community uh, infrastructure, health, youth services, and so on, but also a sector uh, that's extremely important, which is culture and creative industries. Of course, you create jobs. We've heard that you contribute to three 0.7% to the Irish workforce with huge numbers of, of jobs, and this is extremely encouraging. So your efforts to um, help integrate a lot of people, a lot of groups into, labor, uh, into the labor market are remarkable. And uh, of course, um, this is something I think that will continue and with, with the support of your government, you'll, you'll build on. Local development and uh, addressing regional uh, disparities. A lot of social enterprises here in Ireland, as you know, are in rural areas. This is an indicator that they can be and they, contrib and they can contribute also to uh, bridging divides between rural and urban areas. Circle economy objectives, and I have to say that this is one of the best uh, examples that we found in uh, reviewing other countries other social enterprises policies in other countries, you have identified roles for social enterprises in key policies. And the, sec the Deputy Secretary General gave you examples. And one of them is the circular economy and the circular, uh, circular economy, uh, economy uh, action plan. And of course, you innovate and you have different ways of doing uh, business and, and engaging in, in entrepreneurship. So these are few of the many pathways that you are uh, contributing through to economic development and sustainable development in Ireland. Now, this is not that it is not happening in a, in a vacuum. This is happening because you have a significant policy momentum and public attention around social enterprises built on a lot of and a number of strengths. First of all, Ireland is a country where there is a strong culture of providing goods and services for local communities and labor market integration. And this is also done uh, through the work of social enterprises. Of course, the culmination of all this is also the policy. The policy is something, uh, the policy adopted uh, in 2019 is a landmark, is a foundational policy, and this is something that you will continue, I'm sure, building on. The continuous dialogue, and I have to say that while we were conducting the stakeholder um, uh, fact-finding that we did uh, last year, we were amazed by the continuous dialogue that you have around challenging issues such as legal recognition, the need for it, the not need for it. This is something that is healthy. This debate is very healthy. But it's, and, and, and also it's, it's important because uh, this has need, need, needs to be co-constructed. Nothing is adopted, nothing is developed if it's always uh, top down. And last but not least, the data collection exercise that you guys have conducted is one of the best examples that we have seen in developing uh, measures, developing the ecosystem for social enterprises to thrive in, in many, many countries. So now, as, I, as we heard, and I can see that in the room already, you have a vibrant social enterprise community. And these are the few numbers that, you, that uh, come from the, the the, the data collection exercise, so I'm not going to go through them again, but you will have them up in the, in the, 
in, in the report. But what was striking to us is that the concentration in the critical and essential services is very, very important. And of course, the contribution or the share of women in the workforce. And we have seen that in previous, in previous uh, 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 research that we have published uh, this year. But in, in Ireland, where, for instance, on average, 60% even in France or Belgium, but here it's nearly 70%, and it's extremely important. Now, the review has an analysis, as I said, of different pillars, and it has also an action plan to help expand social enterprise potential in Ireland. These are measures that we suggest, we propose. We would like this to be some sort of a ground on which you could work together with the administration to um, develop more, better more and better conditions for social enterprises. And as you can see, we have 10 recommendations. So I'm not going to bore you with giving you each and one of these recommendations. But uh, first of all, I think there is a need to better and still work a little bit on better uh, and uh, better cl clarification, sorry, of the concepts of what a social enterprise is really, and to promote a shared understanding of what it is. Reinforcing, better reinforcement of, and coordination across government for social uh, enterprise policy, Clarifying the legal identification of social enterprises, what, what they are really, social enterprises, I have to recall this again, are enterprises, they are businesses, they need to have trading income, they need to also uh, have a social mission. And whatever they bring as income or as profit, even if this word might seem sometimes very difficult and challenging in the social enterprise space, it's needed to do good. And it's very important that the conditions in which profit is generated are clear and how profit is used are clear. Uh, promoting investment or also, for instance, in viable social enterprises could be one of the avenues, but uh, Melis has the charge <laughs> to explain that a little bit more. And also increasing the strategic prevalence or relevance of uh, available public funding. So, and we, we can walk you through all these recommendations. So I will go to the first element. So as far as clarifying uh, concepts around social enterprises and social entrepreneurship, I think the main points or the main strengths here is that you have already a lot of strong initiatives around social enterprises in Ireland. These have to be a little bit more consolidated maybe, a little bit more leveraged. But there is this, still this perception that social enterprises are not really businesses, but more of charitable organizations with limited business capacity given the historical concentration in provision of goods and services for certain communities. So the need, there is still a need to foster, to help foster this shared understanding across different sectors and different administrations of what uh, social enterprises and social entrepreneurship in general um, are. And this can be done through continued multi-stakeholder dialogue, which you already do. And um, having maybe building on the global, these global standards that were adopted either by the OECD, ILO, the UN, where um, there is clear now, clearer um, uh, definitions of what these concepts are. There is also other examples in, 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 in other countries where maybe um, Ireland could look at, for instance, in Bulgaria, there is uh, a, a policy that was adopted where the national, where there is a national concept for social economy. I mean, social economy and social enterprises are very context-based and they can be defined differently depending on context. But you, they have the same characteristics anyway in, in different, even if, if the definitions are, 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 might be different. The second is to continue and to further the coordination for social enterprise policy. And I think the colleagues are doing a fantastic job. I cannot commend them more. Or maybe I can commend them even more uh, on what they're doing. But I think that the national policy for us as OECD, what we, the, 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 there are, it has many benefits. But one of the main benefits is that it has made 
social enterprises in Ireland more mainstream. And this is not something that we see in many countries. And also, we have seen that there is strong interest for social enterprise strategies, for instance, in regions and cities here in, in Ireland. These are two things that maybe could be stressed more in the new policy. But again, uh, the issue of uh, social enterprises being mostly registered also with the chariter, charities regulator gives them maybe less options to access fiscal incentives or other types of funding. So th these issues around the, the charitable status versus being perceived as businesses with trade and income is something that cuts across many of our recommendations and findings. So I just want to remind you, you here that social enterprises, for instance, and social enterprise legislation in particular, uh, exist in many EU countries already. We have seen that 16 EU countries at least have some form of legislation on social enterprises, and others have strategies, action plans, like you have here in Ireland. And many of these countries that have legislation opt or choose to have what we call statuses or labels or certifications. This is one of the ways. It doesn't have to be the way, but this is one of the ways. And this can be explored through different examples. The, the Secretary General made a reference to France or to Denmark, but there are other examples such as Luxembourg or Poland where there is a clear definition in the law and there are criteria by which social enterprises can be clearly identified. But again, this is just one of the many pathways. We can't stress enough also the need to more coordination. I know that there are a lot of efforts that are being made in Ireland, but stronger coordination to raise the profile of social enterprises as businesses is extremely important. Now I will hand the floor to Melis for the rest of the presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions during the discussion. Thank you. So my turn to hijack the stage. Thanks for the applause for my beginning of, of the rest of the presentation. So I'll pick up from where I'm all left off. And I'm going to again follow the, the building blocks of the recommendation. I had the pleasure to work with Amal and the RCD to conclude the review on Ireland. And we now proceed with, the, with another, yet another very important pillar, which is enabling access to finance. And, and funding. So Amal has just mentioned that in Ireland we see a special case where a lot of social enterprises are opting for um, the, the charitable status. This is mainly to obviously access the much needed uh, fiscal incentives. But we see that this is also leading to probably a common misperception around social enterprises being mostly charitable entities without much capacity to establish viable business models. And this is an assumption that cannot be ruled out for all social enterprises, of course, but this also misrepresents the case of many social enterprises who can and who do establish financially sustainable business models in delivering goods and services. So what we observe uh, in many other countries as well as Ireland is that the available range of financial products, they do not necessarily fit the specific context of social enterprises. Yes, we, we say that they are also businesses, they have trading income, they do deliver goods and services, but of course they have at their core the attainment of longer term societal objectives which a conventional enterprise would not really have in, incorporated into their, their business model which is why some of the financing requirements we see, especially in the conventional financing environment, have criteria that are geared towards conventional enterprises, such as shorter, um, shorter loan repayment periods, stricter collateral requirements, and these do not necessarily apply to social enterprises. So we have to explore other ways of making sure that social enterprises can access the, the tailored financial instruments that they need to satisfy their, their financing needs. And Ireland is lucky in the sense that there are a lot of public or publicly backed 
uh, funding schemes available, such as through CSP, through the Dormant Accounts Fund, Rethink Ireland, or a lot of social lenders such as Clan Credo or Community Finance Ireland. So this is obviously a very positive element to, to the provision of financing or funding uh, to social enterprises in Ireland, but policy has a role in helping unlock this, especially by bringing in some mainstream financing as well and also by changing the way public policy or public funding is supporting social enterprises because we see that usually it focuses a lot on addressing shorter term liquidity issues or helping them with cost containment whereas we can use public funding more strategically for longer term investments to also help social enterprises maybe invest in other areas, invest in their mod uh, models to scale their imp impact across regions. So this, there is an opportunity for public funding as well to explore other ways of helping social enterprises too. We see examples of this in, another in other countries such as the UK where you have the use of dormant account funds uh, in the big society capital. You, you also bring in other banks and you have hybrid mechanisms as well that, that could engage mainstream actors more because it's true that without the mainstream financial actors, the growth of, of social enterprise space will not be uh, capitalized fully. So that, that was one of the pillars that we, that we looked at in the review. And this links to also facilitating access to markets. I think we're going to have a discussion already on public procurement. And this is another thing we look at in the review because public procurement, especially not just public private as well, but public procurement can be an important driver um, for social enterprise development as well. Just uh, across the EU, public procurement is accounting for around 14% of EU GDP. But then we still see 55% of procurement procedures are still using just the, the minimum price as the, as the only award criteria. So we're looking at the inclusion of social clauses, especially in public procurement contracts through socially responsible public procurement so that there is a recognition of societal objectives as well in the procurement processes and this will also help social enterprises access the public markets as well. But then obviously there are problems around this because public contracts tend to be too big usually for social enterprises. And that's why we're looking for other, other examples of how social enterprises can, can better uh, benefit from public uh, procurement. We see in countries such as Spain, Bulgaria, UK, Australia, you have reserved quotas for social enterprises, so you have a minimum percentage where you say, I'm going to source specifically from social economy entities or social enterprises in particular. Or you have an example, for example, from Czechia at the city level. Um, you, you basically say, I have, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, source this particular service from the social enterprises and I'm going to be bringing minimum harmonized procedures to do so. So we have still a lot of examples around this and we have the example of the national campaign in Scotland or Canada where governments are also trying to bring in consumers and private uh, actors into play to help source from uh, source from social economy entities and social enterprises and we've seen the the highlight of this in the in the previous policy in the policy for 2019 and 22 i've looked at the the policy measures so three out of 26 which in my opinion is quite high focus on improved procurement opportunities for social enterprises but again we have challenges around as social enterprises how do i apply for a tender is a burden we have to address because there is limited sometimes capacity on knowing how to compete for a contract. And also on the procurement officer's side, as, as the decision makers, they do not necessarily know how social enterprises operate because as we mentioned, they have a specific societal mission. So they also have to be aware of how social enterprises operate so that they can assess them uh, more properly when it comes to sourcing from social enterprises. And now comes the data part of this. And I have to say the data baseline data collection exercise was one of the best things that happened to our review for sure. Because when we first started looking at the, the state of social enterprises in Ireland, the available information was very outdated. We didn't really understand the scale of what we were talking about perfectly. And we keep saying that social enterprises 
contribute to community development or sustainable economic growth a lot, but there are like two main questions, do they and by how much? So this, this collection exercise really helps us understand at least the size and shape of the space. And uh, this is something that we propose to do on a regular basis, because what is important is also to understand the trends across time, across places. So if this is turned into a regular practice and if information data on social enterprises is collected and published regularly, it will allow us to see if the social enterprise space is shrinking in Ireland or is growing in Ireland, concentrated in, in Dublin or concentrated in rural regions, etc. So we, there is one way of doing this through satellite accounts. Some countries already have satellite accounts on usually social economy entities more broadly. You have um, Canada. Canada calls it non-profit institutions, so it depends from country to country, but you have Luxembourg, Mexico, Portugal. They publish usually biannually or sometimes annually uh, the number of entities, the employment figures, the sectors of activity, etc., which we find very helpful to understand how developed the social enterprise ecosystem is in the country. And another question that we find very important is the social value generated by social enterprises, and this, this relates to social impact measurement, which always comes uh, as one of the priorities in policies, but it's a bit difficult to actually conduct it. There's still a lot of room for social enterprises to practice so social impact measurement more broadly in general. The issue is that we have a lot of requirements. These are usually accountability requirements, so as a social enterprise, I sometimes have to report my impact to my funder or to the policymaker. But then if there is not enough accessible capacity building on how to do this, especially given that there are a trillion ways of measuring impact, um, then it will just become another urden, burden on the shoulders of the social enterprises. So we have to be able to uh, give them with enough resources so that they know how to conduct social impact measurement because otherwise what we see is that it's going to be outsourced to external parties and it's going to become yet another cost so that social enterprises are empowered to understand, manage and report their impact and also showcase what they contribute to the society and there are a lot of examples of this where governments are providing let's say vouchers for example it was an initiative in brazil where government was giving vouchers to social enterprises to um, have access to training on how to measure their impact we have a creation of frameworks around how to measure impact and it's done with public and private actors as well as academia the one example there is uh, is from canada from montreal called the common approach so there are different ways of doing this and then the final where we don't see a lot of examples yet is earmarking financial resources for social impact measurement this would be that i uh, a budget that is given to social enterprises Enterprises would have a percentage in it that has that is earmarked to to be spent on social impact measurement activities. So when we talked about data, I just want to touch quickly on something we've been working on for more than two years, called the country fact sheets, because data on social enterprises or on social economy was not limited only in Ireland. It's still very limited across a lot of countries, and Ireland is one of the countries where we can now more easily access information. So what we did as the OECD was we had, over two years, a lot of exchanges with ministries from 45 countries asking them, what is the number of SSE entities in your country? How, how many people do you employ? What are the sectors of activity? What is the regional dispersion? And this act activity showed us that there are a lot of countries that really do not know even how to define a social enterprise, let alone report the number of entities in it. So with this exercise, we just published four, uh, 34 country fact sheets uh, at national level for, for 34 countries where we try to show if there is a definition, an official definition of social economy or social enterprise in a country, uh, the number of entities, employment patterns, uh, the geographic dispersion of employment, sectors of activity, and then we outline the legal frameworks or fiscal incentives, as well as the, the support for social impact measurement initiatives by public authorities. So we invite you to also take a look at, 
look at this as well, but then this is not a comparative analysis across countries. This is not something we can do yet because a social enterprise in Ireland does not translate into a social enterprise, let's say, in Romania. This, these, this subject still remains very context dependent, which is also blurring efforts to have an, a sense of the aggregate social economy or space at the EU level or worldwide. And finally, we have a lot of networks today, so I'm sure this is going to be one of the topics of discussion. Business and skills development, because this is an issue, just like any other entity, this is also an issue for a lot of social enterprises. Especially in Ireland, we see that there are a lot of support mechanisms and incentives around providing mentorship or counselling, but they're usually geared towards conventional enterprises. There is a lot of provision of these services by the LEOs as well, but then the criteria might sometimes hinder the, the participation of social enterprises because there is still a lot of heavy emphasis on um, trading internationally and other criteria that, that sometimes block social enterprises' access to these services, which can actually be very helpful for them as well. Despite the differences in how they operate, these services, be it mainstream or specifically tailored for social enterprises, are very much needed. So what we observe is that maybe there is a higher potential for higher education institutions and vocational education programs to help social enterprises access the, the capacity building around business development. What we mean is usually around business planning, uh, marketing, branding, scaling internationally. And we see that in Ireland, it's there, it's there, there's a lot of provision of this, but it's fragmented. So as a social enterprise, when I want to seek support on honing my skills around business development, it is complicated for me to understand where to, look, where to start looking for. So maybe consolidating the offers, as Ireland did for the available financial incentives for social enterprises, is one way uh, that could help social enterprises understand what, what is available to them, and also international initiatives such as trade missions. Uh, Netherlands has been doing this a lot at the city level, hosting trade missions or financing trade missions to send their social enterprises to the US so that they can understand what the, the other social enterprises are doing there. Or you can have peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning experiences where you can have uh, different uh, social enterprises from different sectors interact. Spain has an example for this, for example. They, they specifically focus on, on, on cheese manufacturing and they would like to promote social enterprises uh, engaged in cheese manufacturing uh, globally. So these are also other ways that policy can help social enterprises, uh, both with their networking opportunities, but also to better develop their business planning skills. So this would conclude actually our, our, our review, but of course, I mean, it's exchanges like this that is very helpful, and we, maybe this is the first thing we should have said, but we have, we have, we have the chance to look at many other countries uh, with respect to their social enterprise policy, and we, re we clearly see that Ireland is on a very positive track. Uh, where this policy discourse is really serious around social enterprises. So we really look forward to learning more about what we may have missed. So we're here for any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, Sean is at the back there, and I'm at the front. If anyone has any questions, wants to raise a hand, I also have my phone for any WhatsApp messages if anyone's feeling a little shy today. Any questions? Hi. It's more of a comment. Um, I just want to say, um, myself and Diana here, we are both uh, representing social enterprises and we work, um, I'm Traveller and Diana's Roma, so we work with Global Traveller Movement and we have um, representing Bounce Pack Recycling and Diana represents Bounce Pack Upcycling. I'm just saying, from, come from a community that's overrepresented on the live register, we have 80% of our communities unemployed. And then if you look at the statistics, 83% of employers will not employ travellers. So we have a very successful enterprise and we're supporting the circular economy. And we'd like to see more of that because it's a myth, it busts the myth that travellers do not want to work. And, you know, kind of Ireland, within Ireland, travellers are always the first recyclers. So this is a great initiative and we're just delighted to be here to represent, you know, our community to say that, you know, we are there, we want to work and social enterprises has opened doors and opened opportunities for employment for us. So we just want to say thank you very much.
Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Um, yeah. Hi, Claudia. Thanks very much for the report. It's really interesting. Um, I wondered if you could, there was a term you used that I actually didn't understand about social procurement, which was uh, the minimum harmonized procedure. Uh, so maybe you could maybe explain a little bit more about that. Sure. This is usually something used by the European Commission and at the EU level. So what happens is that they would like to urge countries to reserve a certain percentage of public contracts for uh, inclusion of social considerations. So countries are invited to consider when they're giving out contracts uh, to entities to consider and sometimes even report on how many of these, of these uh, procurement contracts also included special considerations on, let's say, social inclusion of vulnerable people or environmental objectives. So the countries are invited to bring in these rules in addition to their usual conventional procurement procedures to make sure that there is a quota that goes towards social enterprises because right now the procure as as mentioned the lowest price is still the the, the main the, the common award criteria with that it has to be a nudge towards countries and towards procurement officers to source from social economy entities and this is usually through rules like this that come from a regulator to to make sure that a, a percentage of public contracts are going to social enterprises and i, I hope that answers the question um, I have a question here on Twitter, which is about what is the OECD's view on cooperatives and their role within the sector in Ireland? This is a very broad question, I have to say. As the social economy, maybe Amal will want to add more as well, but as the social economy team, we see, especially with the data collection exercise, what we see is that cooperatives are one of the indispensable elements of the social economy space uh, in a lot of countries, and they have a specific governance mechanism which would really be heavy on participatory governance. And we've seen in some of the, especially in, in the recent crisis such as the COVID or even beyond, uh, be, uh, before that, during the financial crisis, cooperatives really are a, a source of resilience for a lot of communities. We've seen in the financial crisis that it was mostly the cooperative banks that didn't need bailing out. Or during COVID, we've seen that it was the cooperatives, especially in Italy, if I'm not mistaken, that really uh, stabilized employment and did not go to uh, job loss during these times. So cooperatives definitely offer a model where uh, we can uh, see that the local stability of employment is really maintained and this is partially also through the priorities prioritization of interests of the of the members and workers of the of the cooperatives I don't know if Amal wants to add more on that no I just just wanted to say that um, first of all some social enterprises can be cooperatives as well so as Melis was explaining in in Italy for instance social cooperatives are social enterprises, they're considered social enterprises. So that's a form that could be also available for social in certain countries, it's not maybe the case here in Ireland. And the second thing is, uh, it is. And uh, um, the second thing is that cooperatives, especially the ones active in the banking sector, or, you know, cooperative banks, could also be involved in the access to funding, access to finance, uh, issue. So these are two ways for, for cooperatives to be involved. Okay. I'm in a pickle here now because I could fit in one more question, but it's Brendan Whelan that put his hand up, so I'm really not sure if I want to go there. I'll give you, I'll give you two minutes. I'll, I'll be only a few seconds with the question. Um, just given that you're a global organization and you've looked at loads and loads of countries, are there three things that you would see in other countries that you would say they were great initiatives for social enterprises and you should look carefully at them here in Ireland. Could you identify two or three? I can start with one, uh, favoring the con my country of residence, maybe, France. Um, France has a, a very specific institutional competence for social economy. We used to have a state secretariat on social and solidarity economy. It's still under, the ministry, under a ministry. There is an office for social economy. So there is a, a contact point for, there is at, at the cabinet level, there is a contact point that oversees the policy around social and solidarity economy. And then there is also a, a, 
uh, an, or a type of entity which, which acts like the Chamber of Commerce, but only for social economy entities, that really is the umbrella organization advocating for the, for the rights of social economy entities, including social enterprises. So uh, this is one of the examples where we see that when you have a clear institutional mandate, it's, it's much easier to understand the trends happening in the social economy space. It's much easier to understand and exchange what's happening elsewhere in the world because you basically have a, have a single point of contact that is overseeing the policy around social economy. So that would be one thing that comes, comes to mind for sure. And then we have, as I mentioned, we, we've seen that the satellite accounts, really the availability of data helps a lot because without data we cannot really understand the scale of what we're talking about. So again, countries such as Portugal or Spain, they, they publish information data on social economy on a regular basis and Spain is yet another country that mm -hmm. has uh, five-year public investment plans into social economy, clearly defining every single criteria to, under to, to see what constitutes as a social economy entity. So these would be the, the main things that make our lives easier as, as, uh, easier as reviewers as well when we look at the particular landscape. <laughs> Sorry, I would say also, for instance, Australia in, in certain, in, for certain specific, uh, with certain specific initiatives such as what's, what we have seen, for instance, in the state of uh, Victoria with um, procuring certain goods and services to social enterprises. There, I mean, I, we have reviewed so far almost 20 countries. And we have seen a lot of good things in these 20 countries and a lot of things where there is a need for improvement. Certainly here in Ireland, we have seen a lot of good things also that we will now <laughs> bring to other countries that we will review. So it's very hard for me to, to say these are the three top we, we, we don't, uh, our reviews are not intended to, you know, to say these are, these are the best and these are the worst. We're trying just to bring or to highlight what's good and what needs to be improved. That's all. <laughs> um, I'm going to do one more, if that's okay. So this has just come in from Siobhan Cafferty. When you overlay the recent results of the baseline data, pay levels and the fact that 69% of the workforce in social enterprises in Ireland are female, is there a concern at OECD level that we're creating a level of poverty for women, not just now, but for their future? This is something I'm going to give directly to Amal because she just wrote ne last year a paper on a woman in the social and solidarity economy and we do have some. some yes, um, we, we um, published in March, I think, or April 2023, a paper called, we called it deliberately and in a way to provoke uh, a bit of a debate exactly around this called uh, Beyond Pink Color Jobs. And the idea is to say that, yes, we have seen, and as I was saying in my presentation, that in many countries, or really in most countries where you have a lot of social economy organizations, a lot of social enterprises, 60% of the workforce, or even more, is, is female. And usually in what we have seen as highly or historically been uh, highly feminized sectors, such as childcare, health, education, and so on. Now, this question of pay is, is pay in general is uh, quite, pay in general is quite low in social economy because of many reasons. Because these sectors, because they're essential and critical, uh, they're not very highly, pay, pay uh, levels are not very high. That's, that's something also historically proven and uh, we have evidence around that. It's not maintain, it's not, the issue is not maintaining uh, female in poverty or not. The issue is how do we bring in more men into these uh, jobs so we don't reinforce these stereotypes while also keeping to uh, provide opportunities for women, women to integrate the, the job market. So that's the first thing. The second is maybe social economy, and I think you're doing it already here in Ireland through the contribution of social, social enterprises to circular economy activities and so on, is to diversify the opportunities. I think there is a lot of opportunities out there, and we will have a whole debate about AI, but. I, I, I'm not mentioning here specifically AI, but the digital economy, the green sectors, 
these are areas where maybe uh, social enterprises ought to look a little bit more into and offer opportunities for females so that we don't reinforce these, uh, these uh, the issues of maybe low pay and uh, highly concentrated female participation in the labor market. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Lots of food for thought there, and I'm sure you'll be very busy over um, coffee break. Lots more conversations we had. So, like many social enterprises in Ireland, Rethink have played a really important part in the Shona Project's development over the last few years, and they're here today with some very exciting news. Yeah, as a representative of an organisation that's not yet applied for a Rethink funding, I'll definitely be taking notes. So it's my pleasure to welcome Mario Vitero from Rethink Ireland. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Botero. I'm the Impact Director of Rethink Island. And it's a very exciting day. And I'm very happy to be here with all of you. I just want to start first saying thank you so much to the Department of Rural Community Development for the invitation to be here and for SERI. And I just want to say thanks to all social entrepreneurs who are here in the room and that you're having a huge impact in every single community in Ireland. We, Rethink Island, we truly believe in the impact that you are having. And our commitment has been very clear in the last seven years, where we have been investing more than 13 million euros in more than 160 social enterprises across Ireland in every single county, reaching and having a positive impact in more of than 400,000 people in Ireland. So I'm very happy to be here with good news for the sector. And I'm going to be announcing two new founding opportunities for social enterprises. And I was listening to the OECD recommendations, and I was very happy hearing that through these two founding opportunities, we will be supporting social enterprises having a positive impact, but we are very aligned with the recommendations of the OECD. We are very aligning because we are supporting social enterprises to have access to finance and funding, bringing public and private funding together to support social enterprises at first. Second, we are aiming to be improving the social impact measurement of these social enterprises. We can see the contribution of social enterprises having a huge uh, impact in their communities. And third, providing business support for improving the organizational sustainability. So I will start with the first one, the hybrid social finance loan. That is live, it is on our website, and is a new financial mechanism that has been developed in collaboration between the Department of Rural Community and Development, Community Finance Island, and Rethink Island. We're inviting social enterprises to apply to the hybrid social loan, a great opportunity for social enterprises that are looking to have access to funding and develop a credit record. We're inviting all first times borrowers, social enterprises to apply. What is the award? The award consists of three key elements. The first one is a repayable loan of between 10 to 50,000 euros provided by Community Finance Island. A second one, a non-repayable loan for up to the same amount that will be provided by Rethink Island. And third, business supports for an amount of 10,000 euros that will be provided by Rethink Island. We are aiming to be supporting up to 20 social enterprises through this financial scheme. The call for applications is open up to December 8th, and we will be hosting an online Q&A session next Thursday, the 23rd of November at 1 p.m. We have an exhibition stand today here, so please feel free to come and ask your questions. We will be more than happy to welcome you. The second funding opportunity that I'm announcing here, and I have the pleasure, is that today at 2 p.m. in our website will be launched the new Entrepreneurship Impact Fund, a three million fund that is aiming to support mature and mid-sized social enterprises and social innovations to scale and amplify their impact across Ireland. 
The Entrepreneurship Impact Fund will address the challenge of scaling and reaching growth by providing multi-year fund and providing support in areas of scaling, leadership, impact measurement, and organizational resilience. We are offering two types of supports. The one is the Growth Fund, that will be mainly focused in mature social enterprises, and we're aiming to support mature social enterprises to have transformative impact across Ireland. And the Scale Up Fund, that will be focused in mid-sized social enterprises, and we're aiming to support you to scale and maximize your impact across Ireland. As I'm saying, Please, um, during the coffee break, we have a stand. We will be welcome you. If you have any questions and answers, we will be happy to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Myra. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's been a busy morning already, and it's great to have set the scene for some important conversations that we'll be having later this afternoon. So there's lots to talk about. Uh, let's grab a coffee and a scone and say some hi to some familiar faces. But let's also make some new friends. So what we'd love you all to do is try and make a new connection here today during coffee or lunch. Um, as we said, there's a list on the tables of all the exhibitors that are outside. Please go and talk to them and find out about the supports that they offer. We need you back at your seats by 11.30 if possible. So grab a coffee and we'll see you soon. OK, will we get started again? Great, OK. So, um, welcome back everybody. We hope you all managed to grab a coffee. I know the queue was long. I hope you're all okay and you got sorted and you managed to stretch your legs. Um, as many of you know, the sector was hugely welcoming of our first social enterprise policy in 2019. This was transformative as it recognized our existence for a start as a sector, but it also sent the tone for our growth going forward. The term of our first policy is almost at an end. It's time to now to look to the future. So here to update us on the upcoming national policy for social enterprises, Rob Nicholson, Principal Officer at the Department of Rural and Community Development. Thanks folks, and hello to everybody. Uh, just before I kick off, a um, couple of words of thanks. John Logue, who is in the room, and Siri, uh, just again to mention, uh, helped us develop the day and the very wide agenda to accommodate what we all know is a really diverse um, sector. So um, we've done the policy piece, I think, in the round, and again, thanks to Amal and Melis for, for, for some really good work. Um, effectively, you can treat my input here as the kind of backstop to that, to let you know where we're at domestically. Um, and just to point to the uh, department's team here, Mary you've already heard from, uh, Finton who's the Assistant Secretary in the department for our area, myself, uh, Richard who is at the table here along with John and Anne who is outside so please feel free to chat to us at any stage during the day uh, and we also have Connor Foy who's online who many of you would have met in our kind of bilaterals around the new policy. So really I just want to give you a kind of colour of shape colour and shape of where we're at on the policy. So I can run through it here. That's fantastic, I have it in front of me. So um, where are we at? Obviously, the guys in the OECD have supported us all the way in terms of us trying to think about what it is we want to do on the next policy. And, uh, and uh, that's been the, the kind of international piece uh, in terms of informing us what goes on elsewhere. Um, but from the bottom up, how have we got to where we've got to in terms of drafting the new policy. So obviously we've had some written submissions, many of you around the, the tables here have, have sent them into us. We've also obviously had bilaterals with the likes of representative groups, uh, again, who are here today and having some uh, deep and meaningfuls with our uh, colleagues and other government departments and agencies and so on. Um, we've also held regional town hall type events, five or six of those around the country, uh, basically trying to hear on a regional or local aspect, what social enterprises feel they need to bring themselves forward. Um, and then obviously in terms of the evidence uh, beyond the consultation, the baseline data exercise, which has been referred to a few times this morning, was really key for us because obviously we need to know if we want to get somewhere, where are we at the moment? And to be frank, we didn't have a particular 
particularly accurate pic picture of that. So at least we know now where our standing start is. Um, also the likes of the Nesk Review, Helen Johnson, uh, if you want to look online, a really, really good Nesk Review of Social Enterprise in Ireland, report number 161, if I'm not mistaken, you, can, you could have a look at that. Um, to brief yourselves on, on Nesk view around what's required for the social enterprise. Obviously, again, uh, the OECD and uh, colleagues there and this report has been really central. We've obviously seen drafts as we've gone along, uh, which has informed our thinking about from a policy perspective how we, how we uh, bring the sector forward. And then GECES, which is uh, a working group at uh, EU level uh, with the OECD, um, for the social economy and social enterprise. Social economy obviously being a much uh, broader construct in the Irish sense in that it includes charities, uh, cooperatives and associations with uh, social enterprise being a, a subset of the, the broader social economy. Uh, and then again obviously on the EU policy framework and many of you here I think were in San Sebastian last week or at least a number of you. Um, which, which uh, was the culmination of a lot of work by the Spanish presidency in the area of the social economy. And we also uh, signed up to the EU framework on the social economy uh, back in October via our colleagues in uh, EPSCO, which is the working party which is run through the uh, Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment representing Ireland. So some really good progress there. And I can say at EU level, OECD level and so on, very much consistent with what we've heard from this kind of local up uh, uh, p positioned in Ireland about what's required. So what I'm going to do is give you a sneak preview, sneak verbal preview of where we're at in the development of the social enterprise strategy. Um, I think it's fair to say that everything that the OECD highlighted this morning uh, has been echoed by yourselves in our consultations and I don't think it'll be any surprise to say that they'll all feature in some form or another within the new social enterprise policy. Um, I think it, we will effectively divide the policy into two structures. Now that we've developed uh, to the extent that we have developed from the first policy, there is a bit of that uh, describing the ecosystem within the policy. Where are we? What sort of numbers have we? What sort of social enterprise are we? Uh, what sort of social enterprises have we? Uh, how broad is the sector? And so on and so forth. What's the infra infrastructure that supports the social enterprise sector in Ireland? So it could almost be read from my mind as independent of the second part of the, the policy, which is in draft, which will really highlight the actions and the policy areas which we feel we need to develop over the next number of years. What are those policy areas? So at the moment, and I don't want you to take what I have to say today as being the limit of the work uh, or catching every item. It's just giving you a colour and shape effectively. We've developed the work into five themes uh, and those five themes are what you can see in front of you there. You'll see some of them are common to the first social enterprise strategy. Again, the term I've used is that it's uh, relatively nascent. Uh, in terms of its development in Ireland, so it's not surprising at all that the, some of the same themes remain. So if we look at building awareness, uh, it will uh, include some actions and areas around uh, the likes of the Arise scheme, the likes of conferences like this, networking, newsletters, website, and the general communication side of things, and the role of education and training. Uh, and a broad number of kind of action and policy areas around there. Then in terms of growing social enterprises, the likes of uh, what our OECD colleagues spoke about this morning in terms of building skills, funding supports, government schemes like SICAP and so on, uh, access to finance, uh, market opportunities and the procurement piece, both public and private, uh, and then the issue around the likes of S social, social enterprise quality marks and so on. On to climate action, uh, this is a new one for us. To be frank, we still need to do a little bit of work on this one, but it is around that circular economy, potential actions and opportunities around bioeconomy, community energy and such like. Uh, again, this is something that was highlighted to us really strongly by stakeholders. Uh, we want to hear a little bit more before we round out on that, but we consider it an important part. Then the fourth strand is national and international engagement. Again, it's a sector that's moving apace, both domestically and internationally. So from a policy point of view, the real importance of engagement uh, with our OECD, EU colleagues and so on to find out who's best in class in particular areas and learn from them. Um, at national level, a strong piece around cross-government engagement, so the importance of making sure that government departments, one and all, have some sort of purchase in the area of social enterprise and the broader social economy. Um, and then also embedding social enterprise in our policy thinking. So I, in my 
uh, journey in social enterprise over the last six months since I came into the department. I looked at the likes of regional enterprise plans, local economic and community plans, um, uh, the, the likes of the regional plans through the regional assemblies and the Western Development Commission, who I know are here today, and the likes of, of um, ILDN and local development companies and so on. How do we embed thinking around strategically how do we approach social enterprises within those plans and within those organisations so it becomes a normal thing? It wasn't the last time around. Some did, some didn't. How do we embed that? Uh, and then there will also be an all-Ireland element. And then finally, on to the data, data and social impact measurement piece. Again, you've heard about this this morning. Really strong feature has been highlighted to us by social enterprises as an area that requires support and a bit of daylight, social impact measurement, um, around measurement, better measurement, and how to communicate that, uh, and to avoid greenwashing and, and, and social washing and so on. And then on data. Uh, and I don't think it would be any surprise to say that we've really found the data exercise particularly valuable myself, to be honest. I didn't realise the value of it when I first read it, and has become more so as we try to understand what's happening in the sector. So commitments around what we do in the data space in the future, around the size, scale and scope of the sector and so on. So that's a rapid run through. Um, I won't keep you any more than that, except to say what we intend to do is to have um, a public consultation exercise. Uh, which will be supported, obviously, by full, further bilaterals. Broadly speaking, don't hold me absolutely to this, but broadly speaking, we intend to publish it on December 4th. We will email it to everybody who's on the invite list or the attendance list for this organisation, but it will be more, more widely publicised. Effectively, that will put pen to what I've just described and say why and how and so on, and ask again the sector to come back and tell us, uh, are we right, are we wrong, have we any blind spots? Uh, to see what we can do to finalise uh, for a publication around end of Q1 uh, 2024 for the publication of the second policy. And just one final uh, thing to say. Um, in practically, we have been trying to uh, come up with a title for our new uh, social enterprise policy. Um, we're policy wonks. We're perhaps not the most imaginative in terms of marketing or selling ourselves. And uh, Richard Gavin, who's on the floor here, uh, said to me just yesterday, perhaps seeing as we have you on the floor, it might be good to ask for potential titles for that section, se uh, second social enterprise policy. So what could we call it? Something catchy, something that fits the sector, something that gets us from where we started towards kind of building better or moving the social enterprise sector along. So you have the WhatsApp group. Uh, you also have our own contact details, and if you don't, it's rural.strategy at drcd.gov.ie, and we can email this detail out to you. We'd love to hear uh, from yourselves around potential short, snappy titles for the second policy. Um, so consider it an informal competition, uh, and also a little bit of a cheat from ourselves in terms of uh, trying to get something that works. So look, that's a really rapid run through. Um, Thank you very much for all the support and help so far in terms of giving us guidance around what needs to be on in that second policy. And we look forward to hearing from you as a result of this uh, consultation process, as I say, that we will launch somewhere around the start of December. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rob. I'm sure people are waiting with bated breath for that now. Yeah. So throughout the day, we're going to highlight some of Ireland's new and emerging social enterprises. We're seeing some really inspiring and innovative ideas come to life across Ireland. I'm actually really excited about this first one. Should yeah, first up, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Johnny Lockery. Johnny is the CEO of No Barriers and joins us from Donegal, where he heads the award-winning social enterprise aiming to address accessibility challenges in mobility, strength and fitness. So Johnny, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Hi folks, uh, first of all I'd just like to say we're over the moon to be invited here today and asked to, to talk to you all about our own, our own journey. Um, it's definitely been a, a big, big journey. Um, as I say, my name is no Johnny Lohery from the No Barriers Foundation. I founded the foundation in 2016 um, and just started operating as a CEO two years ago. Um, we're very, very lucky here today to have uh, my colleagues Neve and David who are going to be demonstrating the exoskeleton. Um, so it's a robotic exoskeleton that allows people with spinal cord injuries, brain injury, stroke, MS, amongst others, to walk and rehabilitate in the suit. Um, 
if they have any level of, of existing paralysis. So the demo will be going on here while I'm chatting. Um, if you want to, to have a wee, a wee look there as well. Okay. So one moment is all it takes to change the course of your life. None of us are immune to disability, and at any stage, um, whether it's a, a father, a son, mother, daughter, um, you know, we will end up being in a, in a position where you know, someone within our family will likely need the help of a foundation like, like No Barriers. The problem in Ireland today is people with a disability, with or without money, cannot reach their full rehab potential. However, those with money have a much better chance. At No Barriers Foundation, we believe in an Ireland where everyone with a disability, regardless of their level of disability or ability to pay, can achieve their full rehab potential and maximize their lifelong physical and mental health and well-being in an inclusive community environment. Our mission was to create an inclusive, affordable health facility equipped with specialist neurological equipment, allowing anyone with a disability to train and improve their current level of physical and mental health. Just to give you an idea of the landscape, in Donegal alone, there are 30,000 registered uh, people with a disability. We can cater directly for 13,000 of these. Um, those figures are just in Donegal alone. Uh, no Barriers Foundation would currently be seeing people from uh, a lot of bordering counties and people would drive two to three hours to, to get our services at the minute, so the, the figures are, are huge there. We, we primarily cater for, for three different, um, I suppose, types of clients. So those discharged from acute care with the likes of a spinal cord injury, a stroke or a brain injury, those with progressive ongoing conditions like MS, Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy, um, and also those with intellectual disabilities within the community. So what we do is we operate a, an inclusive gym facility. The important thing with us is that it's not a clinical environment, it's not a hospital environment. People with disabilities are coming in to train and exercise and improve their health and well-being, the same as everybody else within the community. Um, to do that, we're able to access specialist equipment like the likes of the exoskeleton. Um, so we're very, very fortunate. We've worked uh, a huge amount over the years and we currently operate three of seven exoskeletons within the country um, in our gym in, in Donegal here. We also have other types of adaptive equipment, like the Hure uh, equipment, which we are very thankful to Pubble for, for helping us uh, fund, which is wheelchair accessible strength equipment, um, that's smart equipment uh, within our gym. We have skilled and supportive staff, so we're very, very fortunate at the minute we have a team of 18 uh, staff members between full and part-time staff. Uh, that includes neurophysiotherapists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, and speech and language therapists. We offer a safe but challenging and inclusive environment. We have the luxury of having as much privacy for clients as they want when they start the rehab journey. So when they come in initially, we can take them into a private room or a private area to start rehabbing. Um, but we operate a mainstream gym facility uh, with 60 classes per week where we have 150 uh, local members of the community without a disability that come in and train and exercise. So when people feel comfortable and we're able to do that, we try and transition from having a little bit more privacy and one-to-one -one support to integrating our clients into, into the community setting um, where they get to know everybody within the gym. Uh, and it's as much about the crack and the cup of coffee after training as it is um, about the rehab itself. As I say, it's an inclusive gym environment uh, and all those memberships, the 150 memberships at the minute that we have, subsidize the cost for those people that are rehabbing with a disability within our, our center. Uh, our goal is obviously to make it as affordable as we possibly can. <clears throat> so the solution, we, we're very, very committed to improving the physical and mental health of those with physical and intellectual disabilities through evidence-based therapy, exercise, and nutritional support, encouraging greater levels of independence by empowering clients through education, peer support, and goal setting with an emphasis on exercise and physical activity, and advocating for and facilitating the integration of those with varying levels of physical and intellectual disabilities into group exercise, outdoor recreation, and social activities within the community. Uh, and we're very passionate about working with other similar organizations with the same goal. What we hope our clients experience when they come through is cost-effective rehabilitation. Um, typically, we can operate at about 10% of, of what it would cost if we were operating as a, as a private enterprise. Um, we want to offer our clients improved physical condition and health, as I mentioned, a social outlet, education. 
We want to teach them to self-manage. Um, we want to improve their self-esteem and confidence. And the whole environment creates a peer support network with the goal eventually of improving quality of life. We're very fortunate over the years to have developed a strategic partnership with Atlantic Technological University. Um, so a, a strategic partnership developed. We first completed a, a master's level research project, which was published, um, which then later went on to, to uh, get PhD funding. So that's just in the, in the process of getting written up at the minute. But um, the study was basically on a group of uh, individuals who were, had some level of paralysis, would come in and use the suit, and we were measuring the physical changes following a 12-week program with ourselves. We were measuring emotional changes, so we were looking at gal galvanic skin response, so we could tell emotionally what it was like for someone to get up and walk in the suit, and we were looking at quality of life. We since then have uh, received second uh, tier of PhD funding to be looking at uh, how the a health and well-being module we deliver for people with intellectual disabilities is going to be um, affecting and the, the changes and impact we can make in that, in that realm. So, as I say, No Barriers first started in, in 2016. Um, we basically took two years to get us up and running and to get, a, a, I suppose, an infrastructure in place. Um, 2018, we had our first suit, uh, thanks to European Leader Funding, and today, uh, 2018, we also actually got our first staff member, which is David here, <laughs> uh, came on board with us. Uh, now we have 18 staff, thankfully. Um, I originally was, was on the board of directors um, and had stepped off the board of directors just two and a half years ago through circumstances. Um, we had a phys physiotherapist and a clinical lead um, who, who was stepping away and, and uh, I, at the time stepped off the board of directors just to be delivering on the ground. I'm a physiotherapist by trade. Um, and we recruited another uh, clinical lead and physiotherapist, at which point then I stepped into more of a CEO role. I suppose at that point we were just recognizing that, that you know, the thing had to be run as a business. Um, and as we were growing, we needed to just manage, uh, manage that. Um, we thankfully grown organically to minimize exposure and risk. Uh, and last year we ended up tripling in size and are forecasted to double in size again in, in 2024. Um, we had a big year last year in terms of the first year we actually got charity status. Uh, we ended up initially had no money at all, so we were lucky enough to be able to get two gyms within Letterkenny to um, allow us to walk in the suit for free. And just last year we brokered a deal to buy the, the gym that was allowing us to walk for free. So we now are able to operate that uh, as a social enterprise. Um, and we've absorbed the, the staff and we can use that as an ongoing stream of, of revenue while also managing to, to integrate everybody into the, into the gym community. Um, so one of the things that we're very, very passionate about is we just launched a specialist pediatric service within Donegal, which is very, very badly needed. Um, you know, it's, it's great being in an event like this, and one of the things that we'll be looking to do is see if we can network with uh, different other organizations in a similar position, um, and to see if we can, you know, come up with, with new and novel ways of, of getting funding. Um, one of our main goals at the minute is we have three adult um, exoskeleton suits, and we're extremely passionate and driven to get a, a pediatric suit so that children with disabilities can stand and play while in the suit. Um, this will cost us approximately 300,000, but we're, we're making it one of our, our top goals for 2024 to try and um, secure that funding. Um, I suppose, what does it look like if, if we think we're doing a good job for no barriers? You know, we think we will be succeeding if we're not seen as a charity that helps people with a disability, if we're seen as a gym with excellent equipment, staff and services that focus on equality uh, and don't see people with a disability. Thank you. Well done, Danny. Well done. That was well. amazing. Well done. Thank well, you, guys. Very Thank you. Well done, David lads. And Eve. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on with our first panel of the day. And one of our biggest challenges for our sector has been building traded income and making sure that that income is diverse and sustainable. So today is a great opportunity to hear about all the many ways that this can be put into action. Yep. So here to host our first panel on that very subject is CEO of the Irish Social Enterprise Network, Chris Gordon, who will introduce us to the panelists. Sorry. Take it away, Chris. <laughs> I'm 
just loving the overrepresentation of Donegal. Donegal! <laughs> There's never enough Donegal in the panel, this is what I've discussed. Um, welcome everybody, thank you so much, because this is the first panel and it's something that I don't think anybody talks about at all, which is um, money for social enterprise, which is something that I think will be really important. But we have incredible speakers uh, here to be able to give us uh, their sense of it. I'm just about to welcome up on stage, so if we could have Magella, John and Amal back on stage, that'd be great. If you could welcome, please, that'd be great. How are we? Good work. This is excellent. And I'm all. Where's I'm all? Oh, I'm all. Here we go. Hi. Here we go. So we're just going to do a brief introduction. So just maybe if you could tell us who you are and maybe the organisation that you're involved in as a social enterprise, and uh, maybe Majella can kick us off. So I'm Majella Orr. I'm the manager of Colet Farber and Charman. So it's the Craving Community and Enterprise Centre, and we're based in Terman. So a very rural area in Donegal. I, this is what I'm saying. This is brilliant. <laughs> More of this, please. Uh, John. And hi, I'm John Kearns. I'm CEO of Partis, which is a social enterprise in Tala. We'll be 40 years next year uh, on the go. And we're involved in a lot of various methods of traded income. And hi, I'm Amal, and you all met me this morning, so I work in Paris, so if you want to visit me, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, that, people will take up on that, yeah. Amal, don't be, I'm be sure. very careful. <laughs> um, so we did have a panel on diversifying your trading income, which I think actually, and it's been said obviously, is, is just one of the most you know, r ridiculous questions to be asked, because I, I presume you know, the only thing that matters, right, is the social to the detriment of everything else. John, you agree with that, right? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just really starting to fight too early. Um, no, the, 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 the really important thing is, because I think I have been involved in social enterprise since, since it was really emerging here in Ireland, and it's the thing that it's noticeable today, for instance, I think we've crossed various barriers. We, are all, we automatically know that we've got to have traded income. Uh, that we are moving from being an, a, a community group to being a social enterprise. And that's a process that takes time and it takes intent. It, it, it takes a kind of a, an entrepreneurial mindset and it's a process. You won't get there straight away. I mean, one of the things I suppose we have, a, dis, a disadvantage we have, is that usually we're operating in an environment where the market says there's no commercial opportunity. Uh, and then we're supposed to go in and find that commercial opportunity. So there are ways in which we address that. But social for a social enterprise, traded income is not an ixer. It has to be built into the DNA. It's just really, it's just all part of it. It has it's to be absolutely from the in the definition. Because Creving, you guys set up obviously as a community centre organisation. You've diversified your income. There's clearly some incredible thing, the grassroots mm -hmm. initiatives and, and all the rest of it. But is that, you know, but you're a community centre. You should just be the community, right? We are a communi community centre. We are very community focused. But like that, we do have to have traded income. So we have, you name it, people come to us, ask us, can they host, can we host events? We'll do it. We'll try anything. <laughs> and yeah, you're right. We have, um, I suppose, a lot of what we do in the, the winter months, we would be, our centre is buzzing. But in the summer months then, we found there was no income really being generated because nobody wanted to come into classes, nobody wanted to do meetings, have birthday parties or whatever in the summer months. So that's where our second social enterprise, Grassroots Bike Hire, came in, so that we would have our year-round traded income. So, but just on this, did you get any pushback? Because how long has the community centre been going? The community centre will be open 15 years now on the 1st of December. And at what point were you like, OK, we really need to make an income stream here? It needs to be like a... The, the grassroots business started 10 years ago, so long before my time there. <laughs> but um, definitely every year you're finding that you are having to sort of come up with new, uh, new ideas or new initiatives to try and get people through the door. I suppose our latest initiative was um, a digital hub. Yeah, which oh, has been great. Congratulations! I mean, this is a, 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 tr a theme on the panel as well, which is good. <laughs> um, but it, these these are necessary because yes. co-working became a thing. You know, mm -hmm. people wanted the space, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, of course, 
acting entrepreneurially, you're going to be alert to funding opportunities. And there was funding through the Department of Rural and Community Development for under our rural future, for the development of networks of hubs yeah. across the country. But I think the, th the thinking is to take it up from there. For instance, when we were developing our hub called the Edge in Tala, we decided to try and kind of integrate the community into it a little bit more. Yeah. So rather than having just a kind of a reception area, we decided to put it in a coffee shop, a, a speciality coffee shop. And, and also a kind of a black box area so we can do kind of video production, uh, podcast yes. production. So you're, you've now created, rather than just a hub, you've created a kind of a, a broader type hub, which, is, which includes the community. Ownership. Uh, ownership, yeah. So we're not kind of um, a ghetto yeah. for people who are co-working, but actually we're part of the community and everybody mixed around. So we have morning awesome. events and evening events and all. all it's what it was supposed to be and it's fantastic exactly, and yeah. God knows what will happen as a result of that, which is brilliant. Amal, um, as part of the OECD, what ways are you diversifying your income? That's a joke. I'm not. <laughs> please don't answer that. I will I'm just put me to shame. I'm not allowed to answer these questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want to know. You're on camera. Um, uh, can I ask you about the social enterprise report because I think this is important and I do have questions uh, relating to diverse foreign income but you've, you've seen the data, um, the, the, the data that pulled together in, in the survey. A lot of them tend to be charitable entities and you know, you know I, I, I'm really conscious of the fact that as organisations we want to be of the community but we want to be doing well and sometimes people bristle. I know I certainly do and some people say I'm a social enterprise, yeah, I'm all the social, I'm like, yeah, but don't forget about the enterprise, or I'm a social enterprise, but I'm all about the enterprise, and I'm like, oh, but don't forget about the social. Where do we sit in Ireland? What, is it, what, what struck you when you were from, from the OECD point of view for Ireland? Well, it's exactly what you're saying, which is that people are uh, engaged in this space because they want to do good, so the social mission is extremely important. And sometimes um, they, they, they have also to secure the right funding for the, for, to act on the social mission. So, which brings me to the issue of how much traded or traded income do you have to have to do the social mission and how much of the non-traded income you you're really have to run after, in a way. So, um, that's not for me to answer, of course. <laughs> These are for social enterprises to, to, to look into and, and, to, uh, and to try to solve. But in general, uh, a social enterprise is first and foremost a business. So it's, it's an enterprise. It has to be run like an enterprise. The mindset of entrepreneurship has to be in there. But of course, it's a, an enterprise that's run, governed in a specific way. And I'm not going to explain how it is because no, I think no, but everybody. Sure. But yeah. just one thing. But the thing is, <clears throat> once you once this mindset is yeah. is in there, then you can. We, I can list, for instance. I can tell you this is what. Yeah, yeah. Th these are the incomes that you can yeah. you can, for instance, uh, seek if you for the non-trading part, which are grants, donations, yeah. uh, campaigns, public and Hybrid private funding, loans, crowdfunding, sponsorship. These are, you know, well-known type of non-trading income sources. Yeah. But then you have the, the trading income, and this is what yeah. I've been hearing, which is um, selling goods and services. Um, for instance, franchising could be one, yeah. and, and so on. So th this mix, I, I get it sometimes, could be hard to find. But there is a balance to strike between what you bring in as an enterprise, as a business, sure. and what you bring in from a non-business community, which are the grants and the, the public funding. So, uh, and this is a good point, because sometimes you have to see, good Lord, there's a problem here. You know, we need, we need more exoskeleton issues uh, in, in Donegal. And therefore, how do we create a model around that and what works? We, we either start with a need and we have to f like bolt on some kind of, oh, let's <coughs> sell coffee then as a result to, to help fix this. Or the other way around, which is kind of like, I wanna, I've got a business idea, I'm good at business, I wanna do that, but I really wanna help the community. And you know, we've got this challenge at the moment, just doubling down on that. Like, do you see there's a, uh, um, an overall worldwide view of like, which comes first, like a chicken and egg? Yeah, you're not gonna trick me in telling you <laughs> which, which comes first. I think that, uh, when you start a business, well, obviously the, the, the business, I think, yeah. has to come first at some point because you need to generate enough okay. income, enough prof profit, 
I mean, and don't get me wrong, it's reasonable profit. This oh, we, is why we, people we like go profit. into... Yeah, we, we like profit, profit. We but like we profit. need what to... What you do with the profit matters. Yeah, what you do with the profit and how you earn that profit. Yeah. That These are the two things that really are distinctive of any other business. But um, I think th it's... For me, it's and for us, from what we have seen from other countries, it's not the chicken and egg question that's really essential. It's really... You start a business with the idea that yeah. you're going to help your community or certain groups of people or solve a specific need. And for that, you gear your business towards that goal. So yeah. that's, and nope. would you allow me just one minute? During the COVID crisis, we had colleagues in, in the OECD um, that worked, for instance, on uh, the, the, the businesses, or at least businesses in our space, in this, the social economy and social enterprises, that fared well through COVID. Yeah. And they looked into the case of Italy. Yeah. And a lot of these um, enterprises were struggling with this, which yeah. is how to, you know, COVID, with everybody was, there was a shutdown. How do you sell your services? How do you access your customers? Yeah. A lot of them went digital. Yeah. That's one of the ways now I think we, there was no, it, that's a no brainer. We have to, I mean, social enterprises have to engage in that as well. There was this, I'm not gonna say yeah. the digital transformation, but that's a way also to get access to customers to, uh, and to sell your goods Yeah, and you services. can't close that down. No. COVID was awful, but yeah. it did so much for, for transforming that. No, I appreciate that. S business first. Now, obviously, you know, sorry, necessarily the early days of grieving, but now, currently running the center, how much do you think the business matters compared to when you make a decision today? Do you go, today I'm doing environment. Oh, no, no, today I'm doing social. Oh, no, today I need to sell things. What's your, what's your hat on when you wear every day? Because this is the problem that a lot of people and deal so, with. Some days you've got to do all three. <laughs> wear all three hats. Maybe, or two, or one. <laughs> yeah. Right, but that's the challenge, right? It is. Where do you sit with that? It's, it's everything, it's so, everything is so time consuming that you really just need to... I suppose sit down and work out. You have to get your priorities for that particular day and they can change very quickly from morning to afternoon. <laughs> your business is now. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the bikes and tell me a little bit about why that came about, but what okay. difference does it make now that you have it? Yeah, the bikes came about um, 10 years ago because as I said, I discovered nobody was coming into the centre during the summer months. So there was no traded income during the summer months. So. Um, the committee at the time approached Glen Bay National Park. We're very lucky that we are just located 10 kilometres from Glen Bay. So they were on board with the idea. So now from uh, March to October every year, from St. Patrick's Day to Halloween, we go into Glen Bay National Park and hire out the bikes every day, which has been an absolute lifesaver, really. It's, it's fantastic. Um, now, we're sort of the other side of the coin now is that we found from October to March, we're sitting with a shed with 120 bikes. bikes. So now we're hoping we've started doing some work with um, adults, with additional needs and stuff, and some physios as well have um, got our, asked us for their services as well, and mm. children with additional needs as well, to try and make it that year-round income as well. So you have accessibility bikes yes, as well? Yes, we and do. We a have a number of accessibility bikes. So anybody can come, they can view Glenvay Park, use a social enterprise in doing one of our most beautiful places, Donny Call, like, uh, <laughs> um, and, and use a social enterprise in yes. making that happen. It's incredible. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. Uh, the numbers have been amazing and like that through COVID or after the lockdowns, people weren't traveling abroad. Um, we found we had people from all over Ireland who had never been to Donegal before. Can you, can you double down on one thing? You said lifesaver. It's, it's because it created such a great income stream which was able to be reinvested back into the center and into the people. Brilliant. Yeah. And so maintaining all those and that's all the skill sets that you have. Yes, exactly. It's brilliant. And creating employment, of course, as well. It creates three uh, three seasonal positions. Yeah. And a bike mechanic as well. That's incredible. Um, John, the the the. I mean, Tal has now transformed some of Partis particularly, and the Edge now has come on board. But there's other projects that you're building. But when you're considering any of these things, what comes first? Does it all come together? Do you have to, you know, where's the mix and the jumble of all of it? Yeah. Um I think what's, ha what's happening now is, uh, just in picking up what's, what's kind of been said by the other two speakers, I mean, it's social enterprise is now becoming an alternative economic model. Yeah. So you have a commercial economic model, you have a social enterprise economic model, all valid mainstream economic models. We've got to start thinking of ourselves in that way. Um, so 
And I remember kind of many years ago a definition I heard from the States, which is a very simple definition of social enterprise, which was using business methodology to achieve a social aim. So kind of taking those two things, you're just operating as a business. You, your instinct and your DNA is social. Uh, you, like, so for instance, we're developing a big 25,000 square foot food hub. So it will be the first in the country to really kind of grab that European style food hub. Um, and I know that there's talk about another one coming into Dublin City, but that will be a commercial one. I'm already seeing just the way we think. I mean, uh, I was on the train coming up with Amy, and we were kind of talking about, well, we'll have, we will have food training opportunities. We will have kind of the social enterprise food, mark, food academy. You know, so that, because there's actually a problem in the hospitality industry. There's not enough people working in the hospitality industry. And we've got a whole load of people, young, unemployed, or marginalised in some way, who, who don't really leave Tallaght too much. Yes. There's 100,000 people in Tallaght, but they don't leave Tallaght too much. So we've got to create jobs for them in Tala. Now, if we can provide, like when we started our first coffee shop, yeah. we couldn't find one Irish barista. We now have 14 Tala baristas, all trained by us. Unbelievable. Brilliant. Uh, and and th we're going to hold them. There's no kind of, they're, they're not moving anywhere else because they love being in Tala and they love working. <clears throat> one, one second, take a beat, take, take a step back there. The hub, where did it come from and what was the, because you're social enterprise first, really. That's the. Yeah which should be the title of the next social enterprise <laughs> policy, by the way. <laughs> that's my, that's, there's going to be a huge competition. If anybody's going to win it, it's going to be John Kearns. Um, there's a, a hub that's going to be developed. Yeah. And you've been at the start of that. Yeah. To bring? Well, so that the idea, our, our uh, part as an organisation, as a social enterprise, its mission is very simple, to create an inclusive and thriving community. Inclusive, thriving. Um, and... Travel broadens the mind. I've been seeing, because I have two daughters living in London, I've been seeing there's about 30 of these kind of food hubs have opened in London. All part of a kind of a regeneration. They're opening in places like Hackney, Brixton, places like that, Walthamstow. And they're a phenomenon. They're a part of what I kind of jokingly call the hipster uh, economy. Uh, but they're very much in demand, and they're very much of our type of thinking. Um, and actually, some of us were over in Amsterdam. There's a whole load of people here who were in Amsterdam for the Social Enterprise World Forum. And I visited the one in, I forget what it's called now, in Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, um, so this is a phenomenon that's happening. So it's just a question of thinking, could we bring that? And, and you, you, you put various bits, it's entrepreneurial thinking. You put various little bits together and you think, oh, hold on here a minute. We could do this. This could. And then you just wait for the opportunities to arise to, I mean, we're about five years thinking and no, planning about these this. No, these things take time. But it's a process. If they're, if they're for and by, of and by the community, these things can happen. They can have a longer timeline, but then they are owned by the people that they serve, which yeah. in your case is Talibaristas, and, you know, just one example. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and so it will be, it will be a home of, we, we, we have a brewery, a craft That's right. brewery, so we, the, the brewery will be there, Social Enterprise Craft Brewery. Uh, we will have 16 different food outlets uh, we will have training kitchens, we will have a theatre, so it will be an all-in-one new village hub for Tala. I, John Kern's the hipster, I never saw it until now, no. but I'm... I, I've, a, I've, a, I've a replacement to it, but that's as, that's as close as I get. You get the beard. <laughs> Amal, these things are happening across, and people have a choice. They either do it because government mandated it, or because there's a commercial opportunity, and somebody with a bit more money, let's be honest, has investors and does things, and they do it commercially, and then they make more money, that third space, that el oh, third space cafe, third space, that element in between, that social economy. We are a social economy. We are an economy. How important is that? Well, that's extremely important because um, this third way, as you say, is has been growing for years now, mm. and to the to the point of being extremely recognized now worldwide, as I as we said in this morning. So, uh, such a huge increase in interest and um, global momentum, OECD, ILO, I'm not going to go back to all these big organizations that suddenly discovered that this is something happening, there is something. But I just want to pick up on, on, on John's points. The new generation also wants to do business differently. Yeah. 
they want to be more entrepreneurial. There are a lot of OECD studies and other yeah. institution studies that show that young people today don't want to be employees. They want to start business. Not only do they want to start businesses, they want to start businesses with impact, yeah. what they call impact. Yeah. So that's the first point. And the second is um, when they go into these kind of ventures, these kind of enterprises, they look into how to integrate different types of stakeholders. So this might sound jargony with stakeholders. It could be, it could be your local uh, association that deals with women. It could be uh, migrants. It could be refugees. It could mm -hmm. be a number of people where their value is recognized because they're integrated through enterprises. And we have, we had a big conference on, on the social economy um, a few months ago. And one of the highlights of that conference was we invited a, a social enterprise to uh, do, the, do the catering in, in OECD. And that social enterprise employs refugees, refugee ladies. So, um, this is something I think that's not going to stop this this need for alternative ways of doing business. I'm not saying it's the silver bullet. Let's let's be let's be realistic as well. There is room for different types of businesses, different types of ways of doing business, but doing business differently, doing business with a mission or a golden social objective in mind is something that's not going to stop. So I, I, this is brilliant and it's good to see and thank you for the OECD for having uh, you know, an external caterer come in who is a social enterprise. These are the tangible steps that we need to make happen every day for per people to purchase by social. Uh, Cormac from Fantastic, I was chatting to down here, Cormac, I don't know where he's gone now, uh, has got a brand new initiative where they're doing rentals to people with disabilities, those that have accessibility needs, they're doing rentals for for cars and buses and that sort of stuff, but like are open to other people. And there's opportunities to be able to purchase those things, social enterprise, because we need to all think here, particularly in this room, by default, we need to be doing social enterprise. Social enterprise by default. There's another title for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And all right. Uh, but these are really important. What do you say to people that wants to, because you obviously have to get people to purchase from you, right? I mean, selling stuff is one stuff, one thing buying things from you is another. Do you find it difficult to have people purchase from you at the moment? Is that being made easier? Is it a focus that you have? How, par how much part of your strategy is that? What's your selling process, technique, that type of thing? Well, for us, I suppose we don't sort of sell products. We, um, we have offices, we have venues for hire. And because we are very rural, the nearest village is five kilometres away. The nearest town is 20 minute drive away. So people don't have an awful lot of, like for community events, there, there isn't really many other places they can go yeah. at the moment. So I suppose we're lucky in that sense that we are, and we are, I suppose, um, we are and very much community focused. Our mission statement is to provide uh, affordable childcare and co-working space and affordable community facilities. So, so far we have been achieving that. Um, so yeah, at the moment we're okay in that we are there in the community and there isn't anywhere near us at the moment offering the same services, the same venue that we have or the same sort of co-working spaces, hot desks, private offices. There, there aren't any of those as say 20 minute drive away, the nearest one to us at the moment. And this comes back to your point there, which is like an awful lot of these enterprises are set up because there's a deficit and a need. You set that up, you didn't, I'm sure the people in, at the start of that, the community didn't mm -hmm. think, good Lord, we're going to be running bikes in five, set, 10 years. That all kind of comes as yeah. a result of this because there's the power to be able to make all that happen. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to go into this blind and hope that if you have the right mindset, you'll make mm -hmm. things happen. Yeah, as you, once you go down, once you start going down that entrepreneurial path, you've no idea where it's going to lead. I mean, I had no idea that Partners would be running a brewery and two artisan coffee shops and a food hub and, you know, all sorts of... It was unthinkable, really. But I was kind of inspired ages ago. You'll remember, Chris, we had Ger Boucher 20 years Ger ago. Ger Boucher! Ger Boucher, uh, the godfather of social enterprise from the US. But there was a particular model they had in the US which I really loved, which is the kind of parallel traded income. So again, I meant, made a, a mention like, you know, that we're often in a, a, a kind of a, a, a sphere where there's not great com commercial opportunities. There's nothing that says you have to stay in that sphere. 
You can have a parallel traded income in something that's profitable. That's an entirely profitable business, and its sole purpose is to make profit to feed the non-profit. Uh, so it's a model I don't think we've probably taken on board no. too much. Sure. Uh, but I still think I still love it because mm. um, it, 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 ideally we should be aiming to replace funding. Now, 20 years ago, that would have got a gasp. Yeah. Uh, but for me personally, yeah. I look forward to the day when parties can say we no longer need or get any yeah. funding. Yeah. Uh, we're close, but at fun uh, ironically, the further we get away from that, the easier funding becomes. But You're right. <laughs> guys, that's, <laughs> that's it. I think that's a good point. <laughs> guys, shut down the funding. No more, <laughs> no more funding. Um, no, I really appreciate it. Um, let's just wrap it up a little bit, because Amal, I know you've got some contributions, things to be able to... What, what, if you think this audience here, who you've spent time with, you've stakeholders, you've spoken to a lot of us, you're getting a sense of the sector here from Ireland, and it's good to have that external perspective too to give us hope. What are the things, briefly, 30 seconds, do you think this audience need to leave with from this panel, Diversifying Income? And that goes to you too. That's a very tough one. Um, well, a clear idea of that what a social enterprise is. I think it was very well explained throughout this morning um, because that sets the tone for you know, how the business should be done and what is it that you know, social enterprise has to do to diversify income. Yeah. And one last thing is that everything, nothing comes from a vacuum. I think you're doing, yeah. I, I, I'm saying it and you will see it in, in coming days. Uh, we are working a lot on, uh, on social economy and social enterprises. We've been doing that for 25 years, by the way. We will use now Ireland yeah. as an example for a lot of very good best practices on, on this. <laughs> Brilliant. So we're not doing too bad. Is that what your feedback? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Magella. I suppose not to be not to be afraid to investigate new sort of income streams, really. And um, yeah, just be a part be a part of your DNA. Explore yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Don't be afraid to don't be fair, uh, scared of new ideas. <laughs> We're looking to see the hub open in. in and I say, think like a business first and foremost. And, and actually, mainstream commercial businesses would never turn down a penny of funding, yep. would never turn down a grant. Yep. Where we'll, they will apply for every bit and piece of that, and I won't stop either, but I just don't want to be dependent on it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, just to leave everybody, there are campaigns, the procurement pieces come up. By social is so, so important for all of this, but it's incumbent upon us that we have opportunities to know the social enterprises that are, that are there. We don't have to purchase from them, but would you please ask them for a quote? We need to make habit changes in ourselves, and that's a good call out for everybody. A huge thank you to all of our panel for all of their insights. A round of applause for Magella, for John, and for Amal. Thank you very much. And we'll be back on to the conference. Well done, Chris. Well done. Good job, thank you so much, Chris. And as Amal said, there is still no silver bullet, or if she does have one, she's refusing to share it with the group, um, which is not okay. Um, but I think every time we hear these conversations, it brings us a little bit closer to figuring it out. So would you like to hear from another emerging social enterprise? Yeah, okay. So our second emerging social enterprise today is Fibershed. I'm gonna to have to read this because it's complicated. Um, they're a social enterprise whose mission is to create a supported, network of farmers, crafters, processors and designers working together to generate an Irish regenerative fibre system based local fibres, dyes and labour. Thank you very much. Um, I don't actually have a breeze what it means, but I'm really excited to hear more. Yeah, well I'm sure they're going to make a better job of explaining it than you did. Um, so can we please welcome anyway SEI awardees for 2022 and 2023, Malou Collar and Cruz and Jessica Lenners. I don't know if we'll do a better job of explaining yeah. it, but we'll try. <laughs> all right. So, ooh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. I'm Maluka Lorraine, and this is Jessica Lernard, and we're the co-directors of Fibershed Ireland, which I'll explain. But first of all, a show of hands. Uh, raise your hand here. Who's naked right now? Yeah, I, I thought so. Oh, there's um, one in the back. Oh, somebody. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, OK, that's fine by me. I don't care. Um, well, I mean, it is a requirement that in, uh, in society we wear clothes at least 95% of our waking lives. So um, clothes are as important, uh, clothes and textiles are as important to us as the food we eat. And they also play a vital role in keeping us warm and keeping us protected from the elements. Clothes are, in fact, our first form of shelter. Um, so we've already established that we do need clothes um, to live in society, but also it seems like in Ireland we don't just uh, use clothes out of necessity, we actually quite enjoy purchasing new clothes. So much so that per capita consumption of new textiles in 2019 was an average of 53 kilograms per person in Ireland, and that's more than double the EU average. Uh, but we also love to stay up with the trends, so we discard around 170,000 tons of textiles per year. So this is the equivalent of around 35 kilograms per person, and this is again higher than the EU average, which is 26 kilograms per person, uh, which is still quite high, um, but we're even higher than that. Um, so, and, and then again, there's also the social and environmental implications of how even our clothes made. So it is estimated that 70% of clothes imported to, uh, to the EU come from developing countries where practices such as long working hours, uh, underpaying uh, workers and child labor are still quite common. And also we have the issue of synthetic fibers, um, aka plastic, with, uh, which make up around 69% of the textiles we produce, and this trend is rising. And every time we wash these um, artificially cheap synthetic fibers into our washing machines, we are releasing microplastics into our waterways. So, um, you know, the way we produce textiles is still very much uh, rooted in colonialism because around 75% of the emissions related to the textiles we consume in the EU are actually emitted somewhere else in the world. Um, but of course, our reliance on foreign exports of clothes um, also has very real consequences right here on our doorstep. So I am many things. Um, one of them is a fiber farmer. I have a very, very small farm. Um, but as I was setting up my farm and setting up my farming system, I got to know other farmers and started to you know, share resources and tips. And uh, the more I learned, the more I started to see this common theme emerge. Now, many of the farmers that are my friends um, are, are caring for animals that have a very, very fine fleece. And it's so soft that in finished garments, you wear it next to your skin. But what I learned is that most of these uh, fleeces, you know, no one's wearing them. Why? Because they're sitting in bags and sheds. In fact, we have thousands and thousands of bags of this gorgeous fleece just sitting, rotting away in sheds. And if we zoom out from my friends and myself and look at all of the sheep that we have in Ireland, um, which is about four million, we have a lot of wool. And where, you know, it, it, about annually, I think we have about five million kilograms of wool produced. So where is that wool? It's sitting in bags and sheds, and it is shipped out of our country as a waste product. So can I ask you, would you all recognize this as an Irish jumper? I, I bought it here. <laughs> it was sold as an Irish jumper, and it does keep me warm in Irish winters. Um, but this is not Irish wool. So <laughs> um, what, what, we, what we have here is a, a, a massive gap in our system. And our farmers are losing money on this. So they're putting in the cost of shearing. They're not getting a rate of return. Um, one of the other things I am is a biologist, and <laughs> I know that we're also putting in massive amounts of costly inputs into our farming system. These are external inputs that are degrading our soils instead of building them. They're polluting our waterways instead of cleaning them. They're emitting car carbon into our atmosphere instead of sequestering it. And and essentially killing off you know, the wildlife that supports all of us. So a drive to do something about this is what brought me to Malu and to Fibershed Ireland. So what is a fibershed? Um, imagine a watershed, which is a region uh, that kind of produces all the water that, that a specific area requires. And so you know, if we translate that to fibers, 
we've established that Ireland is our fibre shed. Ideally, we would like to get all of our textiles grown, produced and made within the Irish fibre shed. So um, this is a movement that started in California in 2009 and in March 2022 we established the Irish Affiliate uh, with the idea of uh, building networks to craft a regenerative textile system based on Irish local fibres, local dyes and local labour. Um, so in short, we, we want to bring back the textile industry to Ireland as much as possible from the ground up and we want to do it in a way that is beneficial to the landscape, to our communities and to our uh, local economy. So the way we do this is through four main pillars. We promote networking among all the stakeholders in the textile industry, so from farmers to crafters, brands, um, consumers, everyone that is involved with textiles, and that's pretty much all of us, because we are all wearing clothes. Um, we expand opportunities for regenerative farming to support the farmers like Jessica that are transitioning to uh, farming systems that are beneficial for the landscape and for biodiversity. We research avenues for regional fiber processing facilities so we can actually turn the fiber we already grow in the island into lovely and diverse yarns, such as the ones I'm holding in my hand today. And we also engage in education, research and advocacy to shift policy and uh, public awareness and industry towards reducing textile waste and pollution and also to um, increase awareness and appreciation for our local fibers that we have in this beautiful island. Um, so when we close our eyes and we envision the future we want for this place, we see um, biodiverse ecosystems and thriving livelihoods woven together by culturally vibrant Irish fibres. Now, um, we do all of this within a soil-to-soil -soil system, and um, this lovely board here represents that system. <laughs> now, I'm sure the few of you in the front can see this. <laughs> for anyone beyond that, I'll, t I'll give you a hint, it's a circle. So, what we have is we're starting um, down here. If we were to go back to my jumper and put my jumper into this uh, soil to soil system, we'd be starting, oh brilliant, you can see it, lovely. <laughs> it's magic <laughs> technology. Um, we would be starting with our farmland and carbon sink. And so this would be the, the wool that uh, um, is produced by the sheep is Ra they're raised in these biodiverse farmlands. They are uh, building healthy soils instead of degrading them. They are sequestering carbon into our massive amounts of grassland instead of emitting it. So our next step there is the sheep, bast, fiber, and dye. And so that's basically all of our fibers are coming from that system, the wool in my jumper, the uh, flax for our linen, and the dye plants that create um, these lovely, vibrant colors without the pollution. Our next step is the fiber and dye processing, and that's basically what we're doing here is connecting the people who can take this raw fiber process it, connect it with the people who can make this yarn, connect it with the people who can make the jumper. So we're the ones helping to bring this all together again. And as you know, Lou was pointing out, we are kind of fueling this revitalization in what used to be a thriving textile industry. And it's doing it by making all of those connections. We then work to support people to keep the finished garments in use for absolutely as long as possible through mending, through recycling the materials, through um, you know, reselling or swapping. And then finally, because this is a miracle material, when it's at it in its end of life, it goes back into um, the soil as compost and that goes to create fertile soil that then grows the next jumper. So the key point there is that this jumper never becomes trash. It's never shipped off to pollute someone else's community. It completes that cycle. And so we're working to bring all of those pieces together. We're actively creating a network to do this. Um, in fact, tomorrow we are hosting our second annual uh, Fiber Shed Symposium. And we have, what, 80 people in the hall coming together in person, hundreds more online who are from different, um, you know, backgrounds and ages, all coming together to learn and to connect with each other. We have been developing our strategic plan, fine-tuning it, and they are eager to take those next steps with us. Uh, but we do need your help. And so please, let's not 
let's not cut off the funding yet because, <laughs> because we need a bit of that right now. We need uh, that boost to get us to the next step. And specifically, you know, we're a team of seven volunteers. We need the funding to be able to devote the time and resources necessary to be able to continue to build this movement. So, um, you know, my hope is that the next jumper I buy is truly Irish, made from every point of the value chain. And you know, my even greater hope is that you know, looking at rooms like this, filled with people like you, that we will all be wearing Irish-made textiles that are supporting thriving communities and, uh, and a healthy environment for generations to come. So thank you very much. Please come talk to us at the break. Well done, well done. Taking on no small task, completely reimagining the textile industry. Thank you so much, ladies. So our second panel today is a really interesting and important one. And as we all know, technology has brought many challenges to the world, but it's also brought lots of really exciting opportunities. So the introduction of technologies such as AI has left a lot of us feeling a little bit anxious and some of us feeling excited. The reality is the way we work has changed and the entire world has become our oyster, so there's much to learn. Here to host the conversation and ask that very question, will technology change the work of social enterprises, is SERI board member and tech whiz Michelle Fogarty, Fogarty who will introduce the panellists. Thanks, Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. It's really hot in here, isn't it? Yeah, I know, everybody's feeling, and we've got the lunch lag, which is like the worst slot, which John has given us. Um, I want to introduce you to, I'm just keeping an eye on stuff here, this is the tech whiz and me, not. Uh, I want to introduce you to uh, Sam, who is, uh, Sam Marchetti, who is the co-founder of Consortia Co. And they're all, they're all, um, all difficult names here. Milas, who is the policy analyst for the OECD. We have Patrick, who is the co-founder and CTO of Amacitia. See? And finally, Porik, who's the co-founder and CEO of Jump a Grade and also the co-founder of Nurture. So maybe before we get started, because I know like the energy is starting to dip a little bit, can I have just by a show of hands, who here currently is using AI technologies in their social enterprise right now? Okay, a few, nice. We may pull you up onto the panel. Who isn't using AI or emerging technologies but is really feeling like they're being left out and is mildly afraid? Okay, a good show. Okay, so hopefully this panel will help anyway. Brill, well, I might just to kind of kick us off, just ask and kind of throw it out to the panel here. You're all running uh, businesses which have embraced technology, particularly on the AI side. Maybe just start us off, tell us a little bit briefly about your, a little bit about your, about your company and, and kind of, how, how it all fits together from a tech perspective. Sam, I might start with you and we'll work course, our way up yeah. and down. Absolutely, good to connect to everybody here. Delighted to be here. So we run a sure. accelerator type uh, consultancy out of Cork City called Consortia Co. And in essence, that's a collective of consortiums. So we bring people together to collaborate and through those collaborations, aim to drive business development and growth. So we do that for for-profits, not-for-profits and by direct engagement with local government and public sector. So a lot of work we do around the uh, use of AI and artificial yeah. intelligence is teaching people how to write tenders using AI, but also working with government agencies and basically training them on how to evaluate tenders that might have been written with AI. So we're playing both sides of the field wow. and trying to balance it out as best That's as possible. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Milos, we might ask you a little bit. Yeah, I can go back to your previous question as well, and we can promise that we didn't write the report using ChatGPT. <laughs> we can go for sure, but yeah. So we'll as, see. As the, as the OECD, yeah. Sam will check. <laughs> <laughs> so as the OECD, our focus is really on making sure that policy can help uh, AI to can help countries to capitalize on AI while making sure that it remains central to human values and yeah. democracy. So we have a policy observatory, we have a recommendation principle, so we're really trying to urge countries to make sure that they really keep this beast yeah. kind of under control while not limiting it because it, it's something that learns what we teach it. So it's yeah. very important for, from the policy side to make sure that 
uh, we really are using this technology in a way that is respectful of human rights, that is respectful of democracy. So brilliant. that would be my ah, two cents thanks, for this. Nilis. That's brilliant. Patrick. Hello, everybody. Thank you. My name is Patrick Mulvell. So I'm the co-founder of a hybrid social enterprise, and we see here. We're based in Afton Rye. Um, and our enterprise partner, Ent Independent Living Ireland, we provide technologies to support older people and people with disabilities. So mm -hmm. we work across networks of hospitals, nursing mm -hmm. homes, and uh, social care organizations. And the idea is to embed technology within those organizations to support them in their, their care and duties yeah. and tasks. But I very much that. echoing that idea that technology yeah. should be designed for social good and yeah. um, working with those organizations yeah. to ensure that we can help to deliver that. And I loved when we chatted uh, first, Patrick, you kind of talked about originally starting out as a social enterprise, but grounded in technology, and actually the, how you guys have kind of um, evolved over time to bring more of the human components back in. So Yeah, absolutely, because yeah. I, I worked as a web developer myself for yeah. a number of years, and then when we started this organization, myself and my father started this organization, yeah. the, the more we deliver technology, the more we, need, we recognize the need for a social support structures around yeah. those technologies, because sometimes the technologies can in themselves yeah. be isolating, so some yeah. people might see the technology in a, an old person's home and forget to, to check in or whatever. Brilliant. But yeah. There's a real need for those so social infrastructures and I think lots of people in the room are working on those. Yeah. So collaborating across those is very important. Too. I love that. Brilliant. Thanks. Porik. Um, so I'm Porik Hogan, co-founder of Jump a Grade. Uh, we're based out of the University of Limerick and uh, provide targeted one-to-one -to -one tuition to students from underrepresented communities. So think of online grinds, um, but for students that may not be able to access those, so whether from their family background or where they may be based even, mm. and we provide targeted one-to-one -one support with the aim of helping those students then to progress through to third level and skilled work. So like one of our impact me metrics would be showing the outcome of progressing these students through to third level, through to skilled work, yeah. breaking down barriers in their families and in their communities. and. Um, we started it out in 2017, 2018. Conscious, there's quite a number of local development companies here. We'd, we'd have worked with a lot of local development companies over that period of time from and iterated and developed around the support of those local development companies. So I just wanted to recognize that. Yeah. Um, nice. But the ambition for Jump Grade is to become a national service to the students that need it most. And um, what underpins um, Jump Grade is our teachers who deliver the service, but then there's the technology that sits between the teachers and the students. And the technology, obviously, um, you came from LearnAbate yourself. Yeah. Uh, we'd yeah. research <laughs> that was conducted back in 2019, 2020, that looked at um, how to deliver effective feedback to students in a digital environment. And uh, that became a technology in itself. And we spun out uh, Nurture, which I've co-founded also alongside um, David, who co-founded Jump Grade with me, and Nurture is an Enterprise Ireland high potential startup. Mm -hmm. So on one end, we have an Enterprise Ireland high potential startup, which mm -hmm. is embedding AI, embedding technology that sits in between uh, our Jump Grade teachers and students, um, which is a not-for-profit and in the process of becoming a charity. So it's a very unique scenario where you have a service and a technology that uh, one is a charity partner to the technology, one is a technology to the charity. Um, but very. That's great. It's a we, we won't open that can of worms, but we'll put it on next year's agenda, yeah. John, to talk about what is enterprise. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll keep stump and be good. Yeah, John's like sheep's crook, get her off. Uh, obviously, last year, we uh, well, the year before last, we had the launch of ChatGPT, and, and it, it's been huge, and everybody's super excited about it. And I think what it's done is it's really kind of sharpened our focus around emerging technologies and their potential, um, particularly the AI part, right? And I know Milis will be, be, be thinking a little bit internationally on that. I guess I'm curious to know just what's your sense of how you think it's going to shape the Irish, firstly, maybe to the three panelists, how it's going to show, shape the Irish kind of SEN um, ecosystem and what you'd expect there. Anybody's welcome to come in at any point. Oh, don't be polite, start just talk off. all over each other. Yeah, I'll start Fine. off. I think there's a difference that needs to be noted from the offset, because at the OECD report yeah. earlier, we saw there's mm -hmm. a very high proportion of social enterprises that are community settings, yeah. community groups, social care, social settings. So for those type of organisations, I think it's more about optimisation, about looking at resource yeah. constraints, unlocking time, and allowing for more impact to be created. Yeah. In Porek's case, and in cases where there's an innovation element, 
a research yeah. element or a product digitalization element. Yeah. It can be about that scaling, about that international yeah. market marketing and reaching new markets. So there is definitely two categories nice going on and there's one is internal, the other might be a bit more external, external growth focused. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I think yeah. for organizations as well, it's just that opportunity to experiment and yep. there's, there's lots of new and emerging technologies and I think it's maybe not being too afraid to do that, but working in partnership with with people that can support. Yeah. So there's there's lots of opportunities for education and learning, not just in traditional education sectors, but yeah. within this sector as well. So we can use, as we've seen with COVID, we can use technologies in a new way to collaborate. We, we do yeah. an awful lot more online calls, but just embracing technology is, is okay, but we do have to maintain that critical lens. Yeah. And mm -hmm. The social sector needs to be aware of what these technologies can and can't do so that we can respond critically yeah. to support regulation in this sector and support nice. more uh, co platform cooperatives, those yep. types of new models that can come out of this as well. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Kind of echoing yep. what the guys are saying as well, there's probably two buckets. Mm -hmm. There's a bucket where you're looking at what technology, AI being one of those technologies that can provide productivity and efficiencies, but mm -hmm. there's the upskilling of um, teams and of organizations to be able to do that and creating an environment for it to be self-directed, I guess. And I know a lot of what Sam and Patrick do, yeah. you create those environments. Um, but then there's also the bucket, and probably which is a little bit narrower, but with regards to scaling, is the potential of what technology and AI can do <coughs> with regards to differentiating what uh, a service can provide or technology can provide. So trying to categorizing it and looking at it from both angles of efficiencies and looking at it from the perspective of differentiation to an organization also. Mm, nice. Milis, when you kind of put, if you can put your international hat on now, what kind of trends or what are you seeing? How are you seeing the international SEs think about, about uh, AI and these kind of emergent technologies? So this is a topic that can be either black or white or not, not yeah. so much. So the way yeah. we look at it is that, yeah, there are advantages, there are disadvantages, but we've been focusing a bit on the advantages, especially in the context of platform cooperatives. So we okay. recently had two papers on platform cooperatives. Nice. These are basically platforms, online apps or websites where you sell goods or services and that are just like other cooperatives owned by members or workers. Yeah. So in the case of these platform cooperatives, what we observe is that compared to the convention private sector way of capitalizing on data, yeah. uh, they, they rely on open source data not to uh, use data as, as yeah. a product to sell or market, but yeah. rather they use it to improve their governance structures, for example, or improve yeah. the working conditions of their workers. Yeah. Uh, I think it's estimated around 500 that we have uh, platform cooperatives around the right. world. And this has become even more of an issue with the after COVID where, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was the experience in most countries where we started uh, ordering online like crazy. Yeah. And then the working conditions of, of delivery workers have really become an issue because yeah. obviously there was a significant decrease in their well-being. Yeah. And, and then regular online yeah. uh, companies I'm saying regular versus platform cooperatives, which is a very, very <laughs> bad way of looking at this. But then <laughs> platform cooperatives really prioritize, put at the core the interests of their workers and members. And through that, we see that it is possible to still make use of technology while acknowledging that, uh, that you can protect against these negative externalities. Yeah. We also see this in the housing sector where the rentals and online rental platforms are actually having negative externalities on the local community well-being. Mm -hmm whereas social enterprises such as Fair BNB are mm -hmm. responding to this by saying, well, we use technology as well, but we use to improve decision-making, improve participation of local people, stakeholders, as well as our workers in our systems. So still we see a positive trend in making sure nice. that uh, the, the technology is not something that is just putting social enterprises at a disadvantage compared to conventional enterprises, yeah. and instead it can actually <coughs> position them as active players responding to the externalities that are brought about by, by mainstream uh, companies. Nice, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, I guess if we just kind of build on that now, then what, what, like what advice would you guys have, or what advice would anybody have here for a social enterprise really looking to kind of implement AI or in, in, a real emergent technology into, into their business to innovate 
Um, yeah, we're, we're for, for the people, there's some people here that are already using it, but there's others of us that are kind of going, we know we should be doing more. What advice would you have? Maybe I might start with Sam, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. I think like all knowledge or expertise in a business, it's trying to get that de-siloed away from one individual or you know, a select number of individuals. So to try and share the knowledge among the mm. business. So what we've done in our business is we've trained all the staff up on ChatGPT specific to their workflows, specific to their outcomes. Yeah. Um, with that, it creates a bit of an opportunity for social enterprises. You mentioned worker well-being, yeah. and a lot <coughs> of social enterprises I would work with would have very high, high pressure, yeah. high constraint sort of environment. So if you're able to look at employee well-being and organizational well-being through AI, mm -hmm. through upskilling, through making it a bit easier, but helping an individual with their career development and with their ability to mm -hmm. be the best they can in their own role. So the two are, are synchronistic. Yeah. Get the knowledge out of just maybe one person who's using AI, mm -hmm. train the team where possible, mm -hmm. and then with that, try and incorporate a bit of employee well-being yeah. by supporting their personal and professional development. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we tend to have this thought of like when we think about bringing AI in about like the really big fancy things like the LLMs and you know all the big you know machine learning and all that stuff. But actually, you're talking about very simplistic things. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, um, I think it's it, it's important to go back to your social mission and look at actually what you're trying to achieve. Um, technology is is just another tool that will either help you achieve it or will impede you because it'll the cost implications or everything. So. I think it's very important to revisit what you're, what you're trying to do in the community you're trying to serve as well, and then how can technology support you to do that. So taking a conscious decision and, and re-evaluating your social mission in a technology age, because there will be opportunities there and, and harnessing those opportunities will take time as well, because yeah. a lot of the hype around technology tells you that you know, you'll build a website in 30 seconds and stuff. That, it, that's just not true. So it's okay to, to explore these tools and understand them, but always be mindful of what you're actually trying to achieve and who you're trying to support. Yeah. I think most of us have gone down that rabbit hole of getting really yeah. excited and being like, oh my God, look, it can do all these things. But it's kind of a start where you're at. What can it do for me today that I need to do that actually helps me? Yeah. Um, anybody's, yeah. I think, I think um, <coughs> we were chatting about it earlier on about <coughs> play. So like yeah. you hear people talking about playing around with chat GPT or yeah. And um, I suppose that's the starting point. And I'm, I'm not an expert by any means, just so you know, we might have built the technology and we have a CTO that is, is the expert and a team around him. But um, Sam and Patrick talked about it there that um, I guess we're those champions within the team that can have a train to trainer approach almost to train up others and upskill others around um, the use of technology applicable to their role specifically. So. Like I could use an example of uh, a teacher in our context. So there's a number of members of our team that would be very, they'd, they'd be upskilling themselves on, on what's coming next and the chat GPT world all the time or in technology world all the time. And it ties back to, I guess, the mission of what, and vision of what we're trying to do and that's to help every student fulfill their potential. And we know what's at the core of that is that a human relationship between a teacher and a student is so, so important. Um, and that's where critical thinking happens, that's where a relationship is built, where accountability is built. But we know that teachers spend an awful lot of time on administrative tasks like reporting or preparing assessments or um, uh, setting out learning outcomes. And there's the power of AI speaking to a trusted source to reduce a lot of those mundane tasks so teachers are spending their time on what's most effective. And what's most important is that interaction with the student on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. And it's kind of back to Patrick's point of kind of know what you're about, know what your yeah. foundations are, know what you're trying to do, and then drill into that. Milis, anything for you? Or? Yeah, so beyond an enterprise, technology can also <coughs> actually help social enterprises to propagate the, their model, their way of thinking around doing business. I really like the example of Coop Cycle. It's a federation of worker cooperatives operating in the bike delivery sector. And they have 33, I guess, local cooperatives. And they have a open, uh, they have a licensing system and they have a software where cooperatives can use to, for their certain, it's to do their daily operations, also do their accounting, also do their HRs, etc. But they have a requirement to, to, that says that uh, 
to use our license, you have to be a cooperative or mm. commit to become a cooperative. Ah, okay. This is a clever way of incentivizing this shared ownership, uh, cooperative spirit by using your technological uh, resource as well. And we're not just talking about teeny tiny enterprises. We have other examples from Canada. We have fleets over 1,000 vehicles operating as a cooperative using technology. And I really have also like this example from New Zealand, which is Lumio, and it's, it's a social enterprise itself. Yeah. But it's helping other social economy entities with their decision-making processes to make sure that instead of using technology to rate who is the quickest, to rate who is the best, yeah. it's to make sure we involve them in the running of the business, per yeah. se. So these are really very promising examples that we see across the world that can help also disperse this idea of doing something for the betterment of so societal objectives. Um, Sam, could I ask you one quick thing before we get to our just final, final question? Mm. You're working with companies every day of the week implementing new technologies. What's the number one pitfall that you would say most fall into? I think an over-reliance on the technology. I'll use myself for that example because mm. I, we, I think we yeah. coined our um, ChatGPT Bridget as a team member. I think okay. it was Bridget's day. So right. I know more or less the date, <laughs> early February, right. um, just so we could all refer to the ChatGPT in a bit more of a humanistic way. Yeah. I was on a call with a client this week and I jumped on and I multitask all the time. So <coughs> I was chatting to the client and as I was talking to them, I was also pulling up my ChatGPT to run a query and uh, ChatGPT changed. The whole interface was different. So yeah. I had a bit of a mini meltdown on the call where I was <laughs> trying to get this thing to work and yeah. have the conversation. So yeah. that's a classic example of over-reliance. Yeah. So I suppose a, a takeaway, and I know we'll talk about top tips <laughs> later on, but um, go into manual mode every now and again. Yeah. You know, if you're using ChatGPT to yeah. write bids and applications, don't forget how to write it normally and manually yeah. every now and again just yeah. to keep the mind active. Yeah, because it's yeah. your thinking buddy, right? Exactly. It's your you don't want to be overly yeah. loading into yeah. that. So I suppose <coughs> jumping in head first, which can be a good thing in terms yep. of experimentation and play, but yeah, over-reliance and not knowing if you get the wrong answer can also be a very <coughs> cautious area. Yeah. You know, if you get something and you don't know if that's right or wrong and you submit it or give it back to the client, yeah. you can be in danger. Um, maybe just to round out, because everybody, there's a lot going on, you're hearing a lot today. Um, maybe if I just asked every person to, here on the panel just to leave us all with one tip. With, if, you could, if you only took one thing away, if you only remembered one thing from this panel, obviously hopefully you remember it all, but um, what would be your one top tip in terms of that whole piece of like emerging technologies and AI? Either how to use it, how to think about it, what to do. I'm easy, I don't mind what the top tip is. Go. I start. Uh, yeah, go. <coughs> and I probably can give a better tip from the context of our technology um, um, that we've cr we've developed ourselves. But when looking at AI, we're we look very closely at our philosophy that we were going to have from day one, yeah. and um, uh, the philosophy and principles is really important in regards to informing um, what would be developed in parallel with it. So. Just to use an example to try and make sense of that is in education technology, there's lots of tools that teachers use to uh, automate feedback, for example. And um, the, our principle and our philosophy around that is that the human connection always has to be at the core of the relationship between the teacher and the student. Um, so that's principle and philosophy. It's more on the differentiation piece, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would think just look at some of the models that are really utilizing technology in a, in, with a social innovation lens because it's incredibly exciting. Milas has mentioned some of the Lumios yeah. and Open Collective, Airbnb. I mean, it can be absolutely transformative if we adopt them with that social innovation lens. And we are the ones that are skilled in social innovation, so there's no reason why we can't uh, embrace technologies in that way. I love that. Milos, I would say that. on top of, the, of incorporating <coughs> it in the core business, you think of technology to improve participatory governance okay. and think of technology to report, to manage and report your contribution to, to society as well. Nice. Sam? Yes, I suppose we have a very practical tip, but if we zoom away from AI just in terms of digital technology automation, even yeah. the likes of a CRM or something very simple, 
um, map it out first, like map it out on paper, map it out with your team and look at what you're actually looking to, first and foremost, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and try and first see it first on literally pen, paper, pencil. And then from there, look to optimize or innovate or bring in AI. Because I think a lot of people will jump in first to try and just get the job done yeah. without first seeing the big picture. So yeah. map it I first would be my top tip. Great. I was really lucky yesterday. I, I, um, I spent an hour and, hour and a half with someone who's working on an AI accelerator. And there's a whole cohort of AI geniuses. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I'm doing this panel tomorrow. And as usual, I'm really not prepared. Um, I know it's been pretty obvious, but we've won the crowd over, so we're fine. <laughs> and uh, I said, what would be one top tip I should give people? <laughs> but uh, that's just called uh, crowdsourcing. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, he said to me, he said, my, my top tip, he said, Michelle, was he said, ask ChatGPT how best to use ChatGPT. <laughs> and I just thought, oh shit, yeah, that's a really great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we're done. Thanks a million and enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Okay, so it's almost lunchtime, we promise. We are going to feed you really, really soon. But before we go, we're going to hear from our final emerging social enterprise today. And that's Elaine uh, Donoghue, from, who is the general manager of BIA Innovator Campus. So if you don't know and if you haven't heard of her before, BIA is the first food infrastructure project in Ireland. Why do I keep getting the hard bits? <laughs> um, that clusters food sector and innovation supports in one location. The campus spreads over 2,301 square metres and supports over 40 on-site businesses. Yeah, you had me in food. I'm pretty hungry, all right. And here to get us in the mood for lunch is Elaine Donoghue. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me here today, um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm here just to talk to you a little bit about the BIA Innovator Campus. Um, it's a not-for-profit social enterprise uh, based in Galway, uh, in Athenry, and it spans over 29,000 square foot in space, and has a full team uh, to offer support services to the grassroots food industry in Ireland. Um, when I talk about the grassroots food industry, I'm talking about, uh, I suppose, the key level at the bottom of the food chain, whether it be the farmer, fisherman, food uh, manufacturer, chef, anyone who's working at that base industry who wants to grow or progress their business and currently maybe struggles to navigate how they do that. Um, when you think of these type of people, they often wear many hats. So in the morning, they could be producing cheese. In the afternoon, they're dealing with customers. So it's very difficult for these type of micro and small businesses to wear so many hats and to navigate uh, the business world and ensure that they're, first of all, economically sustainable, but also uh, socially and environmentally into the future as well. Um, the challenge that these businesses have is that they sink an awful lot of their initial money into capital infrastructure. Food is highly, highly regulated as an industry um, and to meet the requirements for your business in food production, it involves a huge amount of capital investment and sinking your money in that area doesn't necessarily grow your sales or grow your business or provide an income for you and your family. So uh, our campus aims to provide that uh, instead of cap investing your money in capital, that you use our facilities instead, uh, especially at early stage when you don't know if your business is viable or not, um, but also then to provide the support services and expertise that they don't have the money to access or the know-how um, to really make sure that their business is sustainable into the future. Um, the key challenge, I suppose, is that risk element. So, you know, you don't know if your business is going to work out, but you really want people to enter this stage of entrepreneurship and really be successful at it. So it's important that you wrap those supports around this key community in Ireland. Um, when you think of agriculture, it is one of our key indigenous industries. It's the backbone of many of our rural communities, um, which is critical. Like in Galway alone, there's over 12,000 farms. And you know, when you think of uh, the social infrastructure around rural communities, it was always based around agriculture and food. So we would like to think that these food businesses that grow and develop or get even unstuck by our support uh, can help grow jobs in these rural areas and allow people to, to live their lives in these rural communities and provide jobs at a local level. Um, in 2022, we um, dealt with over 880 food producers through our bread and jam programme, which was very much 
focused around inspiring, motivating these food producers, but also helping them with the bread and butter of running their business. Um, we initially started out to work just within Galway in the west of Ireland, but in 2022 we were dealing with food producers in over 22 counties, which we're very proud of. So it shows that there is a national need for this service. Um, and we carried out in 2022 over 50 workshops, events, inspiration events to really, I suppose, motivate and activate the sector, which is critical. Um, this wouldn't be possible without our founders and our funders to date. So um, our founders are Galway County Council and Chagask. Chagask are the National Agriculture and Food Development Authority, uh, and their key areas that we would utilise are their food science element, but also their um, farm advisory services who advise so many farmers around the country. Um, Galway County Council are very interested in economic development, rural development and community development. So really, you know, how do we grow jobs in rural areas and support the, the rural infrastructure that's there? Um, we're based in Athenry and we are after constructing an 8 million euro campus facility. It consists of three buildings over 29,000 square foot and it offers the food community an opportunity to become really professional. When you think of Google, HubSpot, all these tech companies, they have professional space from which to sell their business from. Often with these small and micro food producers, it's their kitchen table that they bring their food buyer from Dunn stores to see their manufacturing and, and do business dealings. Um, so the food, our campus provides manufacturing space, all the wraparound professional spaces that you would need for running your business, whether that's the buyer showcase room, uh, new product development areas, um, podcast suites, um, and a business engagement zone in general. So I suppose we're trying to professionalise the industry and help the foundation level uh, move up a gear so that uh, this industry can be sustainable for the future. Um, our funders, in order to do this, 8.2 million euro is a difficult uh, um, figure to achieve. A huge amount of investment and expertise has gone into this, but it wouldn't have been possible without the Department of Rural and Community Development, who funded over three million of the campus uh, and understood the wider knock-on impact this is going to have. Um, but also, I see Galway Rural Development are here today as well, and they've provided significant funding through the LEADER programme um, for the fit-out of our campus as well. So we've managed to get this far on the capital end of things, and uh, we're having our official opening in the new year. Uh, we're really focusing on gearing up now our operational side of the house. Um, and we've been lucky in our activity so far. We've had a huge amount of support to deliver that. Um, so into the future, when we focus on operations, the key challenges that we will have in trying to fund that and support that is obviously uh, our facilities are high cost to run and our expertise is unique. You know, this um, expertise is not really available. It's very difficult to procure for the food industry. So it's important that um, we support them to get access at, at a level that they're able to afford uh, into the future and that we can sustain our business as well. Uh, the challenges that we would face in general is, I suppose, trying to find match funding um, for a lot of the applications that we, we write. Uh, also, multi-annual funding so that when you start an initiative that you can continue it and really drive the impact and create that piece of magic that we've done to date. Uh, but it can be very challenging in trying to keep that going, keep our staff going and all the different areas around that. Um, so I suppose when you talk about the services that we provide, I talked earlier about the many different hats that a food business um, wears and you know they have to they have to be good at making their cheese or their product but they also have to make sure that they're making a living wage to support their family and and their own costs you know so it can be anything from commercial support technical manufacturing uh, science uh, sourcing machinery ingredients um, areas that they don't have time to delve into in detail but that we have access to all that expertise so when someone comes to us we provide them firstly with an open door welcome so that they know we're there to support them and we will figure out uh, their needs and requirements and help them through whatever stage they're at. Some businesses are just stuck, others are starting out and they all need that motivation and support. Um, we are able to fast track them through the various agencies that are providing lots of different other grants and supports. Sometimes someone new can't get their head around all that's available. There is a lot of support out there for businesses, but it's trying to navigate that, understanding how to do the procurement processes, how to fill in application forms, um, and follow all the procedures that they need to do. Um, our own team, we're building it. We've started out with expertise in commercial and science. Uh, we have key links into Chagask and all their full brain of facilities and researchers and everything that they have. Uh, but we want to grow that as well, so that we have um, all the different areas of support um, covered 
covered off so they can come to us as a one-stop shop. And we're helping them to incubate, to innovate, and to really ensure sustainability for their business into the future. Um, so I hope that answers a lot of your questions. Today, I'd love to have a chat with anyone who's interested in this area. But again, it's just trying to support this grassroots food industry. And when you think of all the challenges they faced between COVID and the war in the Ukraine, supply chain issues, Brexit, uh, the list is endless. And obviously, sustainability targets into the future is a huge challenge for this industry as well. But they are a key indigenous industry that needs support. Um, and it's a lot of the time, it's with this bread and butter um, business support that's required. They just don't have access to that expertise. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Very much. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Elaine. Um, so now I'm sure you're all glad to hear that lunchtime is upon us. Um, and for those of you who have been joining us online, it's time for us to say goodbye to you. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we want to thank you all so much, uh, all, so much for taking the time, and hope to have you all with us hopefully in person next year. So from myself, Tammy, and the team, take care. For those of you that are with us in person, the news regarding food is if you leave the room here and take a right, the Sari team will show you where to go. Grab a seat, you'll be given soup and sandwiches at your tables. And if you have any dietary requirements, just let us know because we're, we, we will look after you. Um, we do need you back here at 10 past two and we're gonna be really ruthless about that because we need to make sure that all the speakers have their time. And I know there's quite a few of you getting buses and trains and we wanna make sure that nobody misses their bus and trains. So if you can all be back at your seats at 10 past two, that be great. Enjoy your lunch. We'll see you soon. Enjoy. So we're going to get started again for the afternoon. We've got uh, a lot to get through and we really want to get started so that, as we said earlier on, we can get you all on the buses. Um, Sean. Uh, so one of the biggest opportunities for Irish social enterprises in the coming years will be social procurement. We've heard a bit about it already where public and private sector organisations buy products and services from social enterprise, yet very few social enterprises today are benefiting from social procurement and that has to change. So it was my great pleasure to work with our next speaker last year and I know how much they have contributed to the conversation in other countries and how deeply they are committed to working with us here in Ireland. So to hear the corporate perspective on social procurement, please welcome CBRE's Procurement Director, Gavin Callan. Thank you, Tammy, and thank you, Sean. So, I'd first like to thank all the Donegal people in the room for bringing lots of energy. Is there any Donegal people back here from lunch? Okay, lots of energy from Donegal. Um, any dubs in the room? Ooh. I heard that, Sean. Lots, lots of dubs energy as well. And I'd personally like to thank the people of Donegal for giving the dubs lots of energy back in 2014 when they beat us by 3.14 to 17 points in Croke Park and gave us the kick up the backside that we needed to go on and win six Sam Maguires in a row. So thank you very much, Donegal, for bringing so much energy to Dublin and beyond. Um, folks, my name is Gavin Callan and I am the Procurement Director for CBRE um, in Ireland. And the question that I'm here to pose to you today is, an opportunity for social enterprise, corporate social procurement. And there's a question mark at the end of it, and hopefully in 10 or 15 minutes' time, it'll be a slam dunk exclamation mark as opposed to a question mark, because it ain't a question, it is an opportunity. And I'll take you through in a couple of slides why I think it is. First off, who the hell are CBRE, says he. Um, in short, we are the biggest uh, real estate company in the world. We're in pretty much every country. Um, we have two main parts of our business. One is the advisory side, which is a transactionary side. So if you are buying a hotel or buying a shopping center, um, you quite often might see a sign like this on Shop Street in Galway or Patrick Street in Cork, or Grafton Street in Dublin or in the field of Mullingar. 
Um, and that's our advisory side of the business, and they basically sell land and, and, and buildings. I sit in the, the global workplace solutions part of the business, um, and what that does is if effectively we manage the workplaces of tons of big corporates in Ireland. We have 100 clients in Ireland. We turn over about 250 million um, euro in, in revenue. Um, we basically look after the workplace, everything from um, the mechanical, electrical, um, catering, cleaning, security. So the entire workplace experience is, is what we do. Turned over 30 billion, 135 in the Fortune 500 ranking in the States. Um, look, 115,000 employees, blah, blah, blah. Big old company, right? Um, what's, what's next? From an Irish perspective, we partner with clients in every sector. So we're in all 32 counties on the island of Ireland as of last February when we finally got Leitrim and Kerry over the line. We've got three big sectors um, where we play. One is pharma and life sciences, so we have lots of big multinational clients. I think we have nine of the top ten. Um, the Ring of Skiddies, Westports, um, you know, Carlos, all of these places. Um, we, we've got lots of clients there. We have the tech sector where we're heavy on, and data centers would be the, the, the final one. Tech sector is all over the country. And the, data centers is generally around the M50 belt. So that's kind of who we are and what we do. Um, why are we interested in social impact? And why am I here today talking to you about um, social procurement? I guess, look, our supply chain and what we buy is a very important pillar of our social value framework. It's about making conscious decisions about who we work with and how we buy to ensure we're creating benefit for people, for stakeholders, and society as a whole. So having a socially equitable supply chain mm -hmm. enables us to intensify the level of competition and spur innovation. Diversity of thought brings about innovation, and social enterprises bring a clear diversity of thought to our supply chain. It assists our clients in meeting their diversity goals. So increasingly, our clients are coming to us. Um, spoke to one on Tuesday. They had 11 questions back on a new business opportunity, three of them related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we can instill and demonstrate social impact in our value proposition to our clients. So increasingly, these clients in all the sectors on the previous slide are now asking the question in the private sector to say, what are you doing that is socially impactful and, and different? And then finally, we can drive a positive economic growth and impact in underrepresented communities and in the fingers and toes of Ireland and not just in the big urban centres. So that's, that's why we do it. So our commitment. Um, we've made a commitment to spend $3 billion globally with diverse suppliers by 2025, and we're actively engaged in meeting that commitment. So quite often, the first step for a big corporate with you know, big numbers in, in, in terms of turnover and profitability is appointing a chief responsibility officer who actually cares about it. So somebody who sits on the board, wherever that may be, be it in the, in the States or the UK or Germany, China, whatever it is. But unless you have a chief responsibility officer, you're never going to be bought in, and that is never going to fully flow down into your organization. So we did that back in, in 2020. And we have a vice president of global supplier diversity, equity, and inclusion. And all of our diverse spend, including, so, including social enterprise spend, rolls up and is counted. So in 2021, we hit $1 billion globally. And as I said, look, we have to hit $3 billion by 2025. So how does that play from an Irish perspective? Because I'm here and I'm talking about dollars, and I'm talking about boards in the States, and you know, all, all this good stuff. So translate it into Ballon and Slow, speak for me, please. Um, Two years ago, I reached out to Seri um, and hooked up with, with Tammy. And we stole with pride an idea from the UK called the Bisocial Corporate Challenge, um, which was founded in, in 2016. And we launched it with the intent of building a, building a, a, a challenge that really enables social enterprises to engage with the corporate sector. Um, now, the Buy Social Corporate Challenge does two things, right? It helps large big businesses like CBRE 
to engage with a range of innovative social enterprise uh, suppliers and an embed sustainability and diversity into our core operation. And for the social enterprises, it helps high performing social enterprises grow their revenues and impacts by tapping into corporate purchasing power. So the premise is, is quite simple. If businesses need to spend money on products and services, why not spend that money in a way that maximizes their positive impact on society? So the Buy Social Corporate Challenge, as we have stolen with pride from the UK, um, enables a, a package of strategic engagement, supply chain review, training, internal and external comms, brokerage and events. So what have we done since September 21? We are, um, sorry, September 22, we're 13 months into it. Um, we've run a number of, of Zoom sessions. We came out of, out of the pandemic um, and we had a heavy reliance on, on Zoom, I guess. Um, so a lot of people in, in the room I would have met on, on, on these sessions and we, we've tried to, to build momentum. Um, John Logue then came on board um, a couple of months back and we've kind of recalibrated in, in terms of much more of a focus on in-person events because look, we all have Zoom fatigue and we're trying to foster and instill a sense of community and action um, and we're probably going to focus more on a niche number of, of um, high performing social enterprises um, and channel those through. So, look, there's a commitment there from us as a private sector um, buyer that the social enterprise community needs a bit of a giddy up um, and that we're there to you know, help and provide opportunity, mentoring and advice. And while not every social enterprise is gonna be fit for purpose for CBRE, that's perfectly fine. We're happy to invest time and effort to you know, send people in, in the right direction and, and give, give some advice. So that's, that's the intent of the uh, Buy Social Corporate Challenge, as I said, a, a, about a year on the go with SERI. Um, a lot of the stuff that has been said previously here today um, and some really good thought-provoking, insightful commentary. Um, I hope this, um, this diagram or this image sums it up quite well, hopefully. Um, it's something I came across on the internet. It's freely available on the internet. It is a PWC document called The Four Worlds of Work in 2030. It's a white paper or whatever you want to call it. But it is quite thought-provoking in terms of um, what the world of work will look like in 2030. And the lens that I want to focus on today on this is, there's two sides of the coin, and people have mentioned it earlier. It's the buyer's perspective, but also it is the social enterprise perspective of what this world um, looks like and where we are today. So look, if we start off in the, in, in the bottom right, the blue world, corporate is king. It's all about profitability and nothing else. I guess, look, that's pure Reaganomics. It is, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street, Anglo-Irish Bank, whatever you want to call it. But that world purely focused on profit. Um, I would argue if people are stood there, they're standing still, right? Um, if you go up top right, you've got the tech world, uh, innovation rules, digital platforms give outsized reach and influence to those with the winning idea. We talked about ChatGBT all of the disruptors, AI, robotics, what's coming, what will jobs look like in 2030? Will an accountant still be an accountant or will it be done by software that is 100% accurate 100% of the time? Will you need a procurement function or can you press a button somewhere and you get your uh, buy, no buy decision? All of these questions. So there will be jobs at risk, I suppose, in terms of um, the red world and the digital innovation that, that, that will come on it. Um, bottom left, the green world, look, um, climate, sustainability, decarbonisation, the planet, um, the bioeconomy, the circular economy, all of that good stuff comes in. How green is, is the world going to be in, in 2030? Top left, you know, where I would see the social enterprise sector sitting, where, you know, humanness is, is, is highly valued. Um, that is something, you know, there's, there's things coming into our business, you know, we're, we're introducing stuff like menopause leave, andropause leave, domestic violence, uh, abuse leave, all of these things where 
you know, the pandemic brought stuff in like, yeah, look, you can work from home, you can work remotely, you can get all these benefits. And it came back to being a bit more about the person. So again, what is that world going to look like in 2030? So I would challenge everybody in the room to have a think about where your social enterprise sits in terms of, if you imagine that as a game of Twister, have you got one leg in the blue? Have you got two hands in the yellow? Have you got an elbow somewhere where it shouldn't be, right? Um, but to use that lens and, and, and see where you as a social enterprise fit in terms of where you're strong, where you're weak. I guess, you know, John um, from Partis this morning was talking about moving into a blue world, about commerciality, um, and having started off maybe in, in, in a yellow world, and maybe that's a, a natural journey and a natural transition. Um, but not everybody is on the same page and, and the journey is different. If you look at um, the bottom, it says integration. It's a small bit blurry. My apologies for that, but I, I, I did grab it off the internet. Um, corporate integration, big business rules. So, you know, the further to the bottom a procurement organization is, the more likely they are to be just focused on price and price alone. Um, you know, companies get bigger and more in influential. There's mergers and acquisitions. The big ones buy the small ones. What type of corporate are you trying to sell to? The more up the top you go, business fragmentation. Um, and again, that is really large businesses lose their dominance up there. It's about niche, unique services with a unique value proposition. And there's probably more of a reliance on the tech as you go up there as well. So many of those businesses couldn't exist without their digital platform. So, you know, digital is, is, is getting really important. On the left-hand side, the further left you go, so the, the more green and more yellow um, the organization is, you know, the more fair and equitable they are. Um, the common good pr prevails over personal preference, so collective responsibility for the environment, social, <laughs> social good over individual interest, and then far-right individualism, so where me first rule. So I guess it's a very useful tool to map where um, you guys are as a social enterprise, but where your ta target audience in the private sector from, from my perspective sits. Um, so look, hopefully that provides a bit of insight. I think we talked about the yellow, um, about humans coming first, the green. Um, Fibershed is, is, is a great example of, of, of the green, right? A, a really strong social enterprise with an environmental mission. Um, I loved what Johnny um, said as well about, you know, being a gym first and then with a, a, a really unique and compelling uh, value proposition from, from a human factor. So it's about marrying the green with the blue and maybe having arms and legs in, in, in each one. Um, you'll always be dominant in, in one. Um, and look, with my CBRE hat on, we have shareholders, we have to return shareholder value. So we are a blue corporate, but we have a very um, strong leaning towards the green and the yellow while still being a blue. Um, and we'll leave the, the red tech stuff to the techies, but it's, it's absolutely okay to be um, in, in, in all four camps. I am conscious of time, so I'm going to wrap up. So look, my advice to uh, the social enterprise community in Ireland is that, you know, this map, and while it says 2030, it's not about some far-flung version of the future, right? Seven years is not a long time. Um, we all have kids who are growing up too fast, or parents or grandparents who are growing old too fast, right? And by 2030, we're all going to be, be, be different. So, look, I'd, I'd urge people to think about this, think about, you know, the, the, the tech piece, which is highly changing and highly volatile, uh, both from a buyer side and, and from a seller side. I would challenge people to make a bit bigger leap. Um, don't just be constrained by your social enterprise starting point. Um, you might need a more radical change than just a small step away from where you are today. We heard examples um, during the panel discussion earlier about six months of the year community centre, six months of the year bike hire. It's a great example of diversifying your, your, your trading in income. And don't be afraid to make that big leap, I would say. And don't be afraid to challenge the corporate sector to encourage and promote you on, on that journey because there are people out there to do it. Um, final thing, build a very clear narrative. I don't hear 
from social enterprises enough that they are social enterprises. You go to the UK um, and they've got some, some great stories in, in, in the UK. You go to the States, you've got some great stories in, in, in the States and we heard about from the OECD uh, folks about Australia and, uh, and France. So I, I would say, look, there's lots of good things out there, but the commerciality, the being in the blue sector enough doesn't come across to me as a buyer. And I know it's out there, it's just, you know, and, and John and Partis was saying, we're getting into the blue, and I'm putting words in your mouth now about colours, but you know, that's, that's the vibe. So I would love to see and help people get more into the blue and get more into the commercial world. Um, just a couple of numbers about the UK and the Bisocial Corporate Challenge. Um, they started seven years ago with seven founding members. They now have 30. We have one in Ireland. We're the first. We'll hopefully get some more. We'll, we'll do a bit of digging on that. Um, they turned over £350 million with social enterprises in the last seven years, of which £99 million was done in the last 12 months. So you can see the relevance and how it's growing and how it's scaling in the UK. And look, general rule of thumb is for the island of Britain is generally 10 times the population of the island of Ireland. So if they have 350 million, why can't we have one tenth of that, right? Um, and why can't we have that in six or seven years? And why can't the majority of that be in this room? And that's, that's the opportunity, I, I guess. The average procurement budget of a FTSE 100 or a Fortune 500 company is generally regarded to be um, it is 400 times its CSR spend. So, you know, that is 0.25% of corporate spend goes to um, social enterprises and diverse women-owned businesses, ethnic minority-run businesses. We saw in the OCD, uh, OECD report that 3.7% of the workforce is employed in Ireland in social enterprises, yet we're only spending about 0.25%. So if we could scale up and get to 3.7%, Everybody in this room is, is, is going to win, and it's a massive opportunity, not for people in the room solely, but for society as a whole, because there, there's, there's massive, massive social impact. Um, so look, folks, that's me. I am going to shut up now and uh, keep moving. Look, that's a quote from CBRE. Look, we're obviously proud to be part in the green, part in the yellow, part in the blue. It's, it's, it's a, a very good blend. And look. Um, I'm going to be at the Seri stand, hanging around until um, we get kicked out. So if anybody wants to sign up for the Buy Social Corporate Challenges, Social Enterprise, or anybody else, please uh, drop by, connect, have a chat. And then finally, look, I get asked uh, questions all the time by my peers in different countries. And it's like, why don't you have social enterprises in Ireland coming out of the woodwork? Um, look, put very simply, this is a, a closing slide us Paddy's used with, with our colleagues. And while they might say thank you, and it might take two words, and it might take one word or obrigado or whatever it is, I won't pronounce them all because I can't pronounce them all. Um, the minister signed off earlier and she said seven words, and I was delighted to hear her say seven words because that's exactly those. So we do things differently. It might take two somewhere else. We do it by seven, and we do it better, I, I would argue. So on that, I'm going to finish. Gourmet and Ma Nice one, Thanks very much, Gavin. And yeah, I completely agree. If we could get to figures like that, it'd be transformative, not just for, for people in this room, but I think for communities and society at large. Um, just a note as well before we go into breakout rooms that for those of you who are there are a few trains and buses around quarter to four, so we will get you there on time. So you can trust us on that. There's buses arranged outside to bring people to train stations and that. Um, but now, it's time for yourselves to get involved in the conversation. We have three very interesting sessions for you to attend this afternoon. So for any of you who are interested in learning more about philanthropy for social enterprise, we'll ask you to move upstairs in a minute to the Dunlow Suite, where you'll meet founder of Onwards Phil Philanthropy. Can anybody else say that? <laughs> philanthropy, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Darren Ryan. Uh, Rio Walsh from Board Match Ireland will be leading a discussion on building an effective board in the Ockram Suite, which is also upstairs. 
And for all of you who are interested in hearing from the wise and wonderful Cathy Coote of On Metal Rocker on climate action and social enterprise, we're going to stay right here, but maybe Cathy might scoot them all up to the front so that you can get more involved in the conversation. Now, I know what you're thinking. You can't split yourselves into three, and I know there's going to be great learning in each group, but don't worry, we've got a note taker in each room as well, and we'll feed back key learnings after the session. So see you back here at 10 past three. So g'day, I'm Cathy. Um, I'm from Anvehul Roho in Galway. I just want to apologise to any Gwailgors in the room. Um, I'm obviously, you can tell by my accent, I'm from the southernmost county of this country, Queensland in Australia, and so if I mangle the Irish words, I'm really, really sorry. I do apologise. So um, most people like to get the bad news up front. This is the bad news. I don't think it's a secret that we're in the middle of a climate emergency. We know what that means. It means rising temperatures, it means different rainfall, it means sea level rises, it means extreme weather, it means things that never used to happen are suddenly frequent, it means things that always used to happen are suddenly not happening. Um, and that causes a lot of um, human impacts such as increased migration and really serious issues with potentially with our food supply. And I've got a picture there of my native Australia with a kangaroo looking just pretty distressed, trying to escape from a bushfire. Um, and then I've got a picture above that of um, a town in Ireland which was experiencing flooding, Middleton in Cork, uh, about two weeks ago. So my parents, back in Australia, they basically live in an episode of Home and Away, right? They live in a beautiful coastal town with a lovely beach, and they live in a wooden house. And they bought this beautiful wooden house about 25 years ago. And I remember thinking like, oh, wooden house, fires. Um, and my dad said, no, this house is at the top of a rainforest gully, right? Rainforest never burns. I just remember him standing there. Rainforest never burns. And he was absolutely sure and absolutely certain that his wooden house was never going to burn down. Um, now, you might remember about three years ago, there was some really devastating fires in Australia where there was a whole lot of people trapped on a beach and they actually, all the roads were so um, covered in flames and smoke that you couldn't escape the town via the road and they had to com commandeer the Navy to come around and save people uh, off the beach and onto the boats. So my parents' town is one town north of that town and the fires were absolutely everywhere then and I was thinking, <laughs> they're in a wooden house in this, you know, at the top of this allegedly never going to burn rainforest gully. Um, now, their house actually didn't burn down, amazingly. So houses, two houses on either side of their street did burn to the ground, uh, but theirs didn't. And the reason theirs didn't is because, partly because their neighbour, Betty, who's 90 years old, decided she wasn't going to evacuate, she was going to stay and fight the fires, but mostly because when the, when the um, fireys, the, so the Bush Fire Brigade, which is all volunteer run in Australia, everyone just learns to fight fires in these little towns, when they came in and Betty was able to say, oh, there's no one in that house because my parents are away, you need to just get a bit of water onto the roof. And so they managed to save that house, a community effort, the next door neighbour knowing them and the local people being trained as volunteers to fight fires. And to me, you know, if we've got the bad news of climate change, that's the good news. That's how we're going to address this stuff is with community efforts, people knowing each other and being connected to one another. So. Social enterprise is part of that good news. So the challenge we've got as social enterprises is not just reducing emissions. So my own social enterprise, Anvehul Roho, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. So we're very much focused on the direct stuff, like we reduce emissions with what we do and we promote sustainable travel, which also reduces emissions. But it's not just about that. And probably everyone in this room, the social enterprises that they work for or support are doing some of that other part, which is about protecting people from the harms of what's coming. So that includes things like extreme weather or potential threats to food security or potentially integrating new people who've had to move due to the effects of climate change. And we call that resilience. And resilient communities can cope with the effects of climate change. And so social enterprise is a big part of that in every direction. And part of that is also about reimagining how we do business, what enterprise actually even is. So I'm always asked to explain what Anvejo Roja does. So it's pretty simple. We fix bikes. There's nothing too complicated about that. Um, so the bikes that we fix are fixed up as part of a scheme where people are learning the skills of cycle mechanics. 
Uh, we then sell those bikes. We've got a little shop, and that's how we generate money for our social enterprise. And obviously, you can't fix bikes unless you've got the skills to fix bikes. So we're also a teaching organisation. We've got lots of people on different schemes learning the practicalities of fixing bikes. And we've also got um, a great community outreach that we do. Every week, we have a DIY session with our volunteer mechanics. Anyone can come in. Anyone can learn how to fix stuff. Um, it does attract a lot of like bike nerds, but that's great. We like that. They share skills with each other, and they grow what the community uh, needs. Um, in order to be able to have those fixing skills. Um, we talk about active travel. So we want Galway to be a place where people can cycle around without the barriers of traffic and where you know, cycling as a sustainable method of getting around is prioritised. Right? We're also trying to build the circular economy. We're trying to move away from a model where we just chuck things away when we're finished. We're trying to create an economy where we can really um, reuse and have the skills to reuse things, and we value that reuse. Um, and all of those things reduce emissions, thus fighting climate change. And as I say, we're looking at even what is an enterprise. Like, we've chosen to be a cooperative, which, I mean, apparently when, when we went in and said we want to be a not-for-profit cooperative, the, the cooperative people here were like, there's actually no such thing in, in this country as a not-for-profit cooperative. And we said, no, we're just going to do it. So we, uh, we're actually, um, yeah, we're registered as a cooperative. So I do have Bicycle Repairman there. People might remember the Monty Python um, sketch about Bicycle Repairman, who's like a superhero. Um, I would point out that we do, or we did actually have Galway's only female bike mechanic as well, but uh, she went and got a job in a factory. We couldn't pay her as much. Um, so our model's pretty simple. We've got our shop Aroha, which is where we sell our bikes. So we sell um, the second-hand bikes that we have fixed up under our schemes. We also sell new bikes, just like any bike shop, under the Bike to Work scheme. Um, we have paid repairs and services with professional mechanics in there who you can send, leave your bike in and, and get it fixed. We sell the normal accessories that you'd expect, lights and locks and so on. Um, and the money that we generate from that shop Aroha pays for the core stuff, the boring stuff. So, you know, the finance, the insurance, the admin, all of the mu much reporting that we have to do to our various other funders. Uh, and pays for our community activities. So our, our workshop is free to attend every Wednesday night at the DIY. Anyone can come along to that, and we need to pay for things like, you know, bike cables and parts and so on for those workshops. So the DIY, it's great fun. We're there every Wednesday night. If anyone's ever in Galway between 6 and 9 p.m. on a Wednesday night, come on down. It's great fun. We have volunteer mechanics who teach our community members how to fix their bikes. They share skills. Some people come along without... They don't have a bike. They just want to learn. People come along who speak no English and just like the fact that we're doing something really hands-on. It's easy to communicate about. Um, we do ask for a, don a small donation, uh, but we don't push it because we don't want anyone to be excluded by money um, from having a safe, functional bike. And a lot of people have spoken to us. I mean, sometimes people come in and give us a donation and say, you know what, 10 years ago I was a single mum with no money and you guys helped me get a bike functional so that I could keep getting to work or keep getting my kid to school. Um, and so then we also have a recycling centre, which is funded um, through CSP. So we've got a whole um, unit, not, at, not where our shop is, but in another part of Galway and Westside. Uh, and we take bikes that are either sent for scrap at the local council tip, the council recycling centre, or they're donated by members of the public. Um, and so being a mechanic, obviously, a very hands-on thing. You need to see all the problems. It, really, being a bike mechanic should be an apprenticeship, but it's not. Um, so we, we have guys there on schemes who are learning those skills as they go. We've got a proper uh, mechanic who's a, like a professional mechanic who trains them up and he checks the bikes that they've fixed to make sure that they're safe before they're sold. Um, and then the bikes are either sold in our shop or we sometimes sell them like as a job lot for various um, like refugee schemes and so on. So we might sell them to... Um, the University of Sanctuary program, for example, um, at the University of Galway. So every year we do a certain number of bikes uh, for those students. Uh, and they're all of our recycle bikes. Um, and we've also got a formal training centre, which is where you can go along and do a proper certificate in cycle mechanics. Um, so that comes through, uh, the funding for that comes through the um, GRETB, so the Education and Training Board. And some of the learners who come through that then progress on to some of our proper paid traineeships. So that's the model. In theory, it works. Um, so our impact's pretty clear. It's easy for us to track our climate impact because it's very numerical. So we know how many bikes we've repaired and sold. We know how pe many people have come through our training courses. 
you know, we can turn that into how many kilos of metal we've saved, and we can also turn that pretty clearly into carbon emissions because of the life cycle assessment science that we've had done, where we work out the difference between buying a new bike and reusing one of our reused bikes. So any metal, like if you give a bike away for scrap um, and it's not reused the way that we reuse it, it's generally shipped offshore and it's melted down for scrap. And that's like incredibly carbon intensive to do that. Like a kilo of aluminium to melt it down and turn it into something else uses more than a kilo of carbon emissions. So it's actually a very carbon intensive process, which is why the reuse part of that, you know, reuse, repair, recycle um, is really important. And that's why we're, we're so into um, pulling bikes out of that scrap uh, stream if possible. Right, so this is just a picture of our shop Arojo which, um, of course, because we're very into the circular economy, um, it's an old derelict building. that had It was a bike shop about 20 years ago on the Galway University campus. We refitted it after it was kind of derelict for some years, and everything inside it was reused. We reused the old floor. We patched it up with um, new timbers. We used old scaffolding um, timber to create all our shelving. We used pallets to create all of the um, like mechanic benches and counters and so on in the shop and we absolutely love our circular economy shop and I just urge anyone that's in Galway to drop in, have a visit. Um, so I'm very big on green jobs. Um, when I was younger, my first job, I was a giant koala, which is not a very respectable job, um, but I was very into the environment and I used to work for an organisation called the Wilderness Society that was about protecting like old growth forests that we're trashing at such a great rate in Australia. And I used to dress up as a giant koala because that was their fundraising, <laughs> their fundraising technique was to send people like me out in a suit. And it was a pretty stinky suit because it was worn by like hippies in rotation and you'd get into this thing in 40 degree heat and be like, why have I signed up to do this? And ask for, you know, coins, rattling a bucket. Um, and then as I progressed through that organisation, I started to be part of the, the kind of movement to try and stop the old growth forest logging in Australia. And I had this whole road to Damascus moment because I was down in Tasmania, which I don't know if people know this, but it's got some of the most beautiful and ancient forests in the world. And it's also got a government that reckons like that the best thing to do with them is chop them down, not even process them in Australia, but just ship it all off to other countries to be turned into maybe furniture, toilet paper, stuff like that, um, and bring it back into Australia and buy it for knockdown prices. So we don't think that's a great idea. But I was in a kind of town hall community meeting full of these big blokey Aussie guys, you know, like they were the, they had been loggers employed by the state, like maybe a bit like Borden and Mona or one of those kind of organisations, and it had privatised in the 80s, right? So all these guys who had had these salaried government jobs as loggers suddenly had had to take on like debt, like they had, they had become private contractors who would borrow, you know, a million bucks to buy plant equipment, bulldozers and so on, and then they would work on contract for the state logging operation. And I was in this meeting and like, you know, little hippie Kathy, fresh out of her giant koala suit and all these like long haired hippie types saying, oh, you should stop logging guys. It'll be great, like there'll be tourism. And like these, these guys in their work year, like I'll never forget, this guy stood up. He looked like the guy out of Wolf Creek or something. Like he's a big scary looking Aussie guy in his work outfit, you know, and he was crying, he was weeping. Like he was about late 50s maybe, like he wasn't gonna be retraining in any new field. And he was saying, why do you want me to go broke? Why do you want my kids to have to move away from Tasmania to look for work, move to Melbourne or Sydney? Why do you want that? And I had this whole moment where I'm like, this, we're not going to do the green transition in this way by just saying we're shutting it down, guys, just go home, do something else. Um, and so I really wanted to be part of something. When I came to Ireland, that was about green jobs. And that we, when, we could, when people said, what green jobs, we could say, these green jobs and it would be clear what it was what it was about it would be skilled work that people really wanted to do and it would be useful and it would be meaningful work and so the, the jobs that we've provided we've created nine jobs in Galway they're not all state funded jobs like some of them are funded through our shop and we're incredibly proud of that we think that's great um, and I think that really that's the only answer to men like that man who was sitting in that meeting like the only thing we can say is this is what you can do instead, because I just don't think it cuts it to say, like, just stop, um, even though we know that we need to change how we do things and how we make our money. Um, and that's a key part of the just transition is this idea that we don't leave anyone behind. Um, 
So uh, we're also very interested in social justice, which is another key part of the, um, the just transition. So we work a lot with the University of Sanctuary, as I said. We, we don't want to be like a sort of a traditional charity. We didn't want to just find poor, unfortunate University of Sanctuary students and say, here's a bike, off you, off you go, kind of thing. Um, so we worked with them to find out like, why they don't have a bike. And that's actually really, really interesting because a lot of them didn't say, you know, I can't afford it. They said things like, I've nowhere to store it. I live in a dorm room, you know, with 10 other guys. I've nowhere to put it. Things like that. So we tried to supply the accessories that they would need to make it realistic for them to have a bike. Like if they were going to store it outside, maybe they would need a cover to keep it dry, for example. Um, and so we also would do like little workshops with people about how to maintain their bike, how to look after it. A lot of the people that receive those bikes also come into our DIY workshops. And so it's another nice little connection with community that we've created. And there's a little quote there. So I know everyone's always struggling to do the qualitative outcomes research stuff, the, the kind of um, reporting that we all need to do. And I found this really interesting. When we talked to the recipients of those bikes, what they said was not what I thought they would say. Um, I thought they would say things like, oh, great, I've got a bike. It saves me the bus fare or something like that. But actually, all of these um, refugees and asylum seekers said things like, oh, I feel so good to have a bike. I feel really free. It's been great for my mental health, great for my well-being. And so I think that's really important in that we're not just assuming the good that we should do, we're actually talking to people and asking them what they need and meeting those needs. And I think social enterprise is just so much better placed than, than many other um, interventions to do that. So um, as I was saying, like resilient communities, this idea of resilience is really important. Um, one of the most important things that we do is run this DIY workshop every week. Um, because it's where people connect with each other. We have every kind of person come in to that workshop. So we have one old lady who used to come in, um, you can see her there with my son, and she's 80 and she has a giant tricycle. And she loves her tricycle because it keeps her cycling. She said she wouldn't have the balance anymore to cycle. She calls her tricycle Poppy because it reminds her of cycling through poppy fields when she was younger. She's an absolutely lovely woman. Um, and she was coming along to the sessions to learn to fix her bike just like everyone else and it was keeping her bike on the road so that she could keep cycling. And that's just so important to what we do. We've also had people come in. We had one guy the other week who was a tourist from Italy, and he was a wheelchair user, and he'd blown like a, um, one, of his, one of his tires had blown, and he couldn't get around without his wheelchair. Like, he just had this kind of travel wheelchair that he was bringing on holiday with him. And it didn't fit any of the sizes of tires. Like, we had this great trouble because it, it wasn't exactly the same as a bike tire. But our guys were able to put a patch together, you know, they kind of put two tubes together and made a kind of a thing that worked for him. And he was just delighted because it meant that he could then continue on his holiday and, and not, you know, have to go home to Italy or sit in a hotel room for the rest of his trip. So that's, that's really what we're about with the DIY workshops. It's about a place where people connect with other people. And often the problems they solve are nothing to do with bikes. You know, people just meet each other and they, they connect on other issues. Oh, I need help moving house or whatever. So we, we just think that being that little hub in the community is just so, so, so important. Um, but it's also about obviously repair because we know that teaching repair skills is a crucial part of the, tra the transition that we need to make because we need to repair things and keep them going for longer rather than just chucking them away. Um, so we also have, as I said, we have trainee schemes with on-the-job training, so it's proper repair um, that you would use in, in a bike shop. Several of our people have gone on to work just in the other bike shops in the city and county around where we are. We do school visits. Um, you can see a picture there of one of our school visits. So we send mechanics along um, every week during, every year, sorry, during bike week. The guys will, um, you know, they just come along, they, kids bring their bikes in, and the guys kind of fix it, and the kids watch, you know, so the kids are kind of learning as they go, you know, and they ask the kids who wants to pump the tyres and this kind of thing. And the idea is that a bike is made safe uh, during the course of the day, and if any of the work is too big to be done, like on site, the bike gets a little sick note, um, which you can then take over to a proper mechanic if you want to get the work done um, that it needs. We also have a little... Um, bike repair stand, uh, you can see it there, the tall skinny thing, and it's, um, it's outside our shop and our DIY workshop, and it means that if someone comes and is de in desperate need of just pumping the tyres or doing a little fix, you know, and the whole place is closed and it's three o'clock in the morning, it's totally accessible to do those quick repairs and quick fixes. So that's, um, that's been a really good addition to the local area. 
Um, so this idea of a just transition I want to talk about a bit more because I think that's really a, a crucial part of um, what social enterprise has to offer with the climate transition. So there's a quote there, it's, it's um, a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities. And that's, that's a big part of who we are and of Ejoroho. We don't just want to make any jobs. We don't see jobs as a great outcome by themselves. We think they have to be decent jobs. They have to pay a reasonable wage. They have to be skilled jobs. And they have to be jobs that are satisfying and that you like doing. Um, so I'd also say, like, with the community side of what we do, a lot of us are very embedded in the community, but there's also these bigger communities of communities, like the one we're in right now, where we're able to amplify the effects of what we do and make the change we need to make. So we're obviously we're part of SERI um, as an organisation. We're part of the Community Resource Network of Ireland, which is all about um, doing recycling in a way that benefits the community. And they've been a really good organisation for us to be part of. Um, Solid Network is a group of cooperatives that we're part of. Um, New Style Cooperatives, so like Dublin Food Co-op, for example, is another cooperative. Um, and so, yeah, I just would urge people to be as, as involved in these groups as you can be because I just think it's absolutely invaluable to do that. So I want to kind of throw this open to the floor now a bit. Like, I'd like people to talk to each other just for a minute or two and then we'll go around the room and have a talk about what you, your social enterprise or the social enterprises that you're supporting is doing in terms of direct emissions reduction, so directly impacting our climate, but also what your organisation is doing in terms of resilience, like in terms of making communities stronger to meet the challenges that we're already experiencing and that we know are going to become more frequent and more serious over time. So I might just give people about two minutes and then we'll throw it open to the, the roving mics, if that's okay. Okay, so we might come back now to the group. I've got the amazing Megan, and Megan is standing at the ready with her with a movable microphone. So would we like to hear back, I'd like to hear back from people about what your organisations are doing around these two elements of climate change. Can we have a... I'm going to pick on people if no one comes forward. <laughs> okay, I reckon PJ over there. PJ really looks like he has something to contribute. <laughs> Put your hand up, PJ. The roving mic is coming to you. Keep going. He's there. <laughs> I missed the question there, so, give it so a, the question I was is, talking so much. <laughs> what is your organisation doing on emissions, direct emissions reduction and also on increasing resilience in your community? Yeah, so definitely the first part of that question about what are we doing. Um, so I'm with IRD Duhalo, um, a local development company in Cork. Um, when we think of climate, there's kind of two things we do that probably is unrelated to most people here, but we'd also have like EIP pro programs and Blue Dot um, um, programs. So a big part of that would be results-based payments for farmers to do things on their farm that would obviously help the local rivers and uh, help the local ecosystem. Um, for the circular economy, we have revamp, IRD to hello furniture revamp, and which is furniture revamp, which is in the name, but we also got into paint recycling as well, so that's part of the Real Love Paint, I suppose, group that's uh, in three discovery centres involved in two more social enterprises in Cork. Um, so that would probably be the most clear benefit that we have, so the furniture restoration and the paint, so you're um, basically saving a lot of stuff from going to landfill, and especially the paint would go to Germany to get incinerated. So we track all that. To, um, to, to show what our, I suppose our impact is on the, um, uh, the environment. But as part, a way of um, c uh, resilience within communities, it's probably something we haven't thought about. I know it's a good example with, say, Middleton and preparing mm -hmm. people for the floods. But for us, I suppose, it would be just um, trying to incorporate changes in purchasing a trend, we'll say, like, rather than going to whatever other local place to buy paint. Maybe just think about re-love paint and how they can have a clear benefit there and uh, I suppose keeping local jobs in that form resilience. But um, it's definitely something we could look into more about training for probably natural disasters and mm. floods and certain things like that. But something we'd have to think about. That's fantastic. No, that's really good. I know um, IRD Duhalo is doing a lot, of, a lot of great things. Um, so someone else from another part of the country. Haven't heard from anyone from Donegal for about five minutes, so it might be time, might be time for them to say what they're doing. <laughs> like... well, 
I'll, I'll give a shout out for County Kilkenny then. Uh, uh, just in, as part of a men's shed there, uh, we do we have bees uh, and we produce honey and that gets snapped up. But it's been interesting to watch how many people are sort of, you know, just amazed that the 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 short link between producing and consuming. That if if you if and and so few people make things. I mean, even even I think cooking is not. Yep. production anymore it's very often assembly you know a jar of ragu and a jar of that mm. and that's the dinner and so i think that us in the men's shed we, we we get people stop by and just watch us fix a stool or something uh, that's been kind of an issue because because for those of us who do produce uh, we've maybe forgotten just how alien it is yeah and i think that social enterprises have got an opportunity uh, to to switch or to help bridge the producer-consumer divide that yeah, it is. Absolutely. So many people don't actually produce anything. Yeah. Uh, and that's problematic from a resilience point of view. I mean, that's absolutely true. And we do find at the workshop as well, it's probably not unlike a men's shed, but with maybe a few more girls there. <laughs> but if you start fixing something, people are mesmerised. Like, they absolutely love it. We have kids that come along regularly. We have just all kinds of people because they're so fascinated at the idea of doing something themselves or even watching someone do that. Thank you. That was really good. All right. So we've, got, we've covered Kilkenny and Cork. I've covered Australia. What else, who else have we got? Like, <laughs> so someone here. Um, hi, I'm with uh, Bounce Back Recycling and oh, Bounce Back Upcycling. Um, so I suppose we have like quite a big um, impact on recycling and the environment. But um, I was thinking when you were talking, sorry, when you were talking about the community, um, impact we don't really have that and I think that's quite a good idea so I was even thinking the way we have the upcycling project and we do the upcycling of the furniture mm -hmm. we could probably maybe have like DIY workshops where we do teach people how to um, sorry yeah, <laughs> how to um, do the upcycling uh, of their own furniture at home rather than them coming into the shop and paying for it um, so I think that would be a good idea. Just that's, that's great. Yeah, and I mean, the is that the um, furniture, like the upholstery and that sort of stuff that you do? Or? Um, yeah, so yeah. what we do, um, basically, whatever item can be salvaged or whoever wants to donate furniture, we take it in and we upcycle it, we clean it, and then we resell it. Um, so we keep the circular economy going. Um, but we also have um, the upholstery. So whoever has, um, let's say, um, if they have a piece of furniture that they love and they don't want to get rid of, we upholster it for them. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to venture out into new areas like clothing alterations as well, um, where we could help with the, the amount of clothes people throw up as well, throw out, sorry, <laughs> um, as well. So that, um, That's fantastic. And like, I do love it when a community that has skills like realises that the rest of us have lost the skills. And so I'm sure there are, um, I've seen some beautiful work done by traveller women that's like sewing and so on. And like poor hopeless people like me that wouldn't have a clue, like I would totally come along to a session just to learn some of those skills. Um, and I'm sure the same would be true for the upholstery or the furniture work as well. Like, so that, yeah, it's a great idea. We should get together. You're in Galway. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Thank Definitely. you. Thanks very much. Um, so there's someone over here. Thank you. So uh, my name is Rachel from Westmeath, uh, representing Water Street Association, which set up in a small town in North Westmead mm -hmm. during COVID when we really saw that uh, there was a need for the community to start a whole community conversation about uh, what was happening in the town. We looked at the town square and 28% of buildings on the town square were derelict and vacant. And a lot of new families had moved to our community during COVID and we were hearing that young families and young mothers particularly were very isolated and finding it very hard to connect. So we started with a couple of questions and um, the questions were, what is it that our community can do best? What might our community require help with? And what does our community need outside agencies to do for mm. them? 
and we thought that the ordering of those questions was really important to kind of build agency yeah. in the community. So since then, we've kind of got going. We've got a long lease on a property with a cottage, a hall, and half acre. We've set up community garden, a mini orchard. At the same time, we opened a uh, number of uh, refugees arrived in the town and we started just working with them as neighbors. So it's kind of neighbor to neighbor. Um, yeah, look, uh, lots of things happening and also trying to just keep the doors open and yeah. pay the fuel as well. But we've been awarded a, a lot of money very early in our journey and that's actually... <laughs> It's not as straightforward as it might sound, so yeah. we're trying to make sure that kind of the eight people who are the Water Street Association uh, are up for that, are yeah. ready for that, are safe around that, and so on. So, you know, we're kind of looking at maybe a model like sociocracy hmm. to support yeah. our work, That's but great. we're really open to linking with anybody else who kind of resonates with any of the above. That's fantastic. And that integration work that you're doing, I know I had um, movement of people as a kind of an impact of climate change. It doesn't have to be a negative impact if we can do it right. And so I was just um, thinking that that kind of integration work that you, you're doing there is like some of the most important work that there is at the minute with climate change, even though it doesn't, you know, there's no direct way to measure emissions about it or anything like that, but that bringing people in and forming a community where there wasn't one before is crucial. Right, has anyone else got a climate change? How are we for time? Um, do we need to be winding up? All right, so should we wind up? All right, if, if no one else has an action to take, so pretty simple, three key takeaways. We need social enterprise for the just transition. We need to stay connected within our communities. And we need to measure and report what we do, not just directly on emissions, but on how we're connecting communities. Cool. Thank you. All righty. So we hope you all had a lovely chat at those um, breakout rooms. We popped into a couple of them. They look great. We just invite everyone to take a seat, and we'll do a quick wrap up before we bring on our last speaker. Do we have everyone back? We do, don't we? Okay, so let's get some feedback from the various different rooms. Um, first up was Philanthropy for Social Enterprise with Darren Ryan, Brendan, White, Brendan Whelan, you were in that group. Do you want to give us a one minute sum up as to what the conversation was about? Yeah, um, we, we had a really, really great session with Darren. He's, a, he's an expert in this space and uh, I think everyone was enthused at the end of it. And I'd say we're probably, given that that's his business now, they were probably all giving him business cards and, and lining up interviews with him. Um, he just mentioned maybe the five elements of philanthropy that he would see as critical. Um, all self-reinforcing. Number one was energy. So whoever is the promoter really needs to display that energy when they're with the philanthropist. Pitching it, you need to be very clear about what it is you're uh, proposing, what, what your cause is. Um, asking, which can always be a very a difficult thing to actually ask for the, the, the money. Uh, building up a pipeline um, so that you're not just dependent on one and uh, having a community of people to support you, whether it's your board, your team, and so forth. So that was essentially the, the presentation from Dara, for Darren, and in, we, had a, we only had a couple of minutes for, for chatting. There were two, I think, points came out of it. Um, one was uh, getting to the person. Um, a lot of people would think that philanthropy, you, you sort of look, at, look outside your organization. He would, the emphasis from Darren would be look inside your organization and you'll find connections, and they're much easier to, to work with. And uh, I think he made another very good point when uh, he was talking about, but as a CEO, I don't have time to be doing this. I'll, I'll hire a fundraiser. Darren would have said, no, don't hire a fundraiser. Hire a, an ops manager if you need him. Free up the time for you to do it, because you're the person who's going to uh, sell it to the philanthropist. Thank you, Brendan. And um, I also heard that... 
Darren was giving away free mugs upstairs. Yeah. I did not get one. I don't know if anybody did. And I'd say if there was any criticism of that, se of that session, it was probably that it was too short. Yes. Could have gone on for longer. OK, our second panel was on building an effective board. When you get it right, it can be transformative. We'd like to thank Ria Walsh for facilitating the chat. Lorraine, you were in that room. Any takeaways first? Yeah, absolutely. We had a great presentation from Ria. So thanks a million. And Board Match is a superb organisation. Um, they've just helped us recruit a new board member for Microfinance Ireland. So I'd highly recommend their services. But Ria went through what they do. Um, and I suppose if we look at the questions that were raised after, after she spoke, it was all about, you know, what do you do with the disruptive board member if you have one? Um, you know, the, the area of the reality of the CEO maybe having more power than they should, term limits and how does that work, you know, overcoming conflicts of interest, looking at balances of gender and youth, um, and I suppose the, the importance of being able to bring that, that diversity in. A couple of the things that she would have said around that would have been around working with your community and the community you serve been represented on that board and having that voice on the board is important. Planning, she would have spoken about that. Uh, the importance of your constitution and what, what you're allowed to do. A strong chair, that, uh, that, that was a key piece. But also training and working with other organisations, for example, youth organisations or other bodies to make sure that you're getting this right. But I suppose it's that constant review of who's on the board, what's happening and what mm -hmm. do you need to plan for and next. But certainly they offer a great service. So I would uh, suggest that people go there both for board members, but also register to be a board member. Thank you, Lorraine. That's really helpful. And our final group um, was looking at the role of social enterprise in tackling climate change. That was the one that was happening here with Cathy Coote from Anmehal Rohar. Shawnee, you were in that room? Uh, yes, and uh, Cathy gave us a really good outline of her work. And actually, I think it was a really good example of storytelling, something that we all need to do. So uh, the question really that was put to the room was, uh, what is your social enterprise doing and how do you measure it? So it was around climate and resilience. Uh, so we spoke about um, the producer-consumer divide. Um, so we've sometimes, I think the, what people said was that um, we've forgotten the production element and some of the basic uh, principles of creativity and, and the skills that we've lost along the way. Um, people spoke about the fascination of redoing. Um, we had some really good examples from, uh, from West Mees, from Cork, uh, from Galway. Um, we kept Donegal out of it at this stage because they were here all day. Um, so um, it was about community conversations as well and the importance of community conversations. Um, but I think that um, Cathy herself just took synopsized it very well just as she finished up there talking about social enterprise, the climate justice, staying connected and report on what we do. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, who facilitated those conversations. I'm sure we'd have all have loved to take those conversations much further, and we do encourage you to do so. There's lots of uh, opportunities here today for collaboration, knowledge sharing, and peer support, which to me is one of the most important bits when we support and share with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, just before we bring today to a close, we'd like to do this by hearing from one of Ireland's most authentic and inspiring social enterprises. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet Eileen properly for the first time earlier today, but I've heard her speak multiple times, uh, and I know, Tammy, you're a massive fan as well. My obsessed fangirling right now. <laughs> um, at this stage, I know Eileen very well, and to me, Eileen epitomises the term quiet power, and I think the world needs more of that kind of leadership. So Eileen is proof that we can create positives from every negative in our lives, and she's just a powerful force of good, so I can't wait to hear from her. Please welcome Eileen McHugh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <laughs> that's a lot to live up to. Um, sweating even more now. I'm not an experienced public speaker. I hate public speaking, but um, our story is special and it is authentic. So I, I never mind pushing the boundaries to um, do that. So who am I and what's here together? Um, my name is Eileen and I'm founder of Hair Together. Um, Hair Together is a social enterprise and we teach hairdressing and barbering training alongside wellbeing activities and education. And we started as a passion project in the local GAA. Um, how did we? Purely by accident, there was a couple of young people struggling in the club and I'm a hairdresser. What could I give them? I'm a barber as well. So we started with a little 
a few classes for them to keep them entertained in the winter months. Um, it was really, really popular. Um, hairdressing kind of saved my life. I grew up in Ballymun. I took my first drug when I was 12. I had all the adversities and challenges that an area like that throws at young people. Um, I, I suffered with addiction. I, I witnessed criminality, violence. Um, so up to the age of 29, when I found recovery, it was an amazing time. Um, yeah, found recovery. And my business partner in Hair Together is Gemma. She's a similar background, obviously we're close in age, but she's a psychotherapist and that's where she found her, her jam. So together, like Hair Together is a mix of the hair industry, the magic of the hair industry, and like Gemma's wellness uh, background. Sorry, I need to take a breath. <laughs> um, yeah, Gemma actually works with under 18s with uh, alcohol and other drugs um, issues. So yeah, like trying to think of what's so special about Hair Together and it's really, really magic. Like we have young people, like our lists, are, their waiting lists are great. We have them queuing outside the classes, telling us that their key worker said, if I do this, that and the other, I'll get on the next course. So like that to me is just amazing. Um, and I was trying to kind of, what is it? So I think during lockdown, you kind of understand how special um, Thanks. How special the, the hair industry is. Did any of you miss your barber or your hairdresser during lockdown? <laughs> Everybody. But what happens in the salon, I swear to God, it's, like, it really helped me develop like, life skills, communication skills, um, good healthy hair. But like, in the salon, people come in and they feel seen, heard and supported. And no matter what's going on, like we hear about your pregnancies and your weddings and your affairs before any of you do. It's a space where people come to, uh, and look, they walk out with a renewed sense of self. They, they feel taller, they, they feel better. And that's what, we took the same kind of principles and that's how the young people walk out of our classes. They feel connection. They feel just new and kind of supported. So I have a little video. Uh, it's just a woman in a clip and it's just, uh, it was recorded after our last programme, probably about two months wrapped up. It's like a graduation day. We work over the 10 weeks together as a team. And if you just want to play it, we'll kind of hear what they have to say so I can get some more. To see the kids progress from starting off, not being able, as I said, like not being able to even talk to each other or look at each other, even eye contact, and progress to be able to have the confidence to sit down and think about what they were going to do today and then actually execute it is amazing. It's amazing to see them grow. We've learned uh, a few style of methods. Uh, what's better with cutting hair and how, just how everything works, how it works in the shops and all. It's just, what I hope happens is that I get to move to a different country and start cutting hair out in my own shop. It was great, it was very really good, learning new stuff, talking new, meeting new people, just doing something and doing something I enjoy. It's great. It's like getting more comfortable, settling in more and just like not being afraid to ask questions and stuff like that and just doing your own thing. I think it's important to look at the future when you're young and learn how to do it and trying to get trying to get big and everything and then once because I'm learning this now and then once I'm 18, I'll know how to do it full time, so I'll have to go into another barber course. So, <laughs> so just to put into perspective, like the young people when they come into us, they all have they're from diverse backgrounds. They all have kind of challenges for for them to stand up in front of like a camera and tell their experience. Like you hear Dylan. Like, he's actually come back with us. He does demos for the new kids. Like, his skin fading is, like, unreal. <laughs> but, like, that, that's the, the confidence you give them. He uh, just made me not put... It was OK for kind of governments and whatever, but it wasn't to go up on Facebook or Instagram. But he's really proud of it. Um, and I was going to talk about kind of... It's actually this thing we seen yesterday, and I just have to say it, Gemma, don't say the flea thing. <laughs> we were at a conference yesterday and explained it perfect. Like, they did a, a test on or an experiment with fleas. They put them in a jar and closed the lid. And they were bopping up and down and banging themselves off the top of the, off the lid. By day three, they just stopped and they weren't jumping anymore than the lid. They weren't hitting the lid anymore. But what happened when they opened the lid, the fleas didn't come out. They were kind of, so that's what kind of happens with people that grow up in areas like that. They're limited in beliefs. They're not able to 
dream big or think big, I'll get upset now, <laughs> so don't get uncomfortable if I cry, I cry every day. So um, it's all good, but it really, it's really special to see people getting the confidence, because it happened to us, someone helped us along the way. Um, and I was going to moan about the challenges and stuff that we have in the sector in regards to funding, bad pay, um, and all of the things that like young social ent entrepreneurs kind of struggle with. But I do have to say, like, in rooms like this and the last year and a half anyway, I feel seen, heard and support. And I actually love it. It's like, I didn't think I'd ever find anything that would kind of make me more passionate than I was about hair. And to go from the best to the best, like I'd not shown off, but I travel to Paris and Copenhagen and do all fancy stuff in the hair to come back to being a newbie at business, but just having passion and drive to be able to do it. And the reason I'm able to do it is because I have support and I do feel it. And even though I think the sector is in its kind of adolescent stage, I think we haven't figured it out, but I think together we're doing pretty all right. So um, I feel like Dylan. <laughs> I, feel, I feel supported and seen and cared for. So I just want to say thanks. And I forgot everything else. And the bus is probably waiting. So thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Well done, Eileen. Thanks very much. Um, that was very interesting. Very inspiring. Very inspiring. Nice note to end the day. So, um, yeah, I think overall today has been very interesting, informative, inspiring, hopefully. Uh, and we'd like to thank everyone who took part in these conversations and as well our speakers, facilitators, panellists and exhibitors. We'd also like to thank the Department of Rural and Community Development, the OECD, for bringing that really important international perspective to Surrey for organising the conference, to the advisory committee on their suggestions for topics. I'd also, if you don't mind, on a personal note, like to say how, what a pleasure it is to present with the next generation of social <laughs> enterprises. And for those of you that do this work, I would say talk about it at home. Share it with your kids, because you would hopefully inspire them to care about social impact, and then maybe someday they'll be as burnt out and underpaid as you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more burnt out and more underpaid. <laughs> Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, Estella and all the team in the hotel then as well, uh, Bernard Coyle and his team then as well on AV. Thank you very much, lads. I think a special round of applause for John and Megan from Surrey for putting together. Uh, most of all, we'd like to thank all of you for travelling, some of you quite a way to be here with us today. We hope you all manage to glean some food for thought and when you leave you'll have a renewed sense of that purpose and that potential of the social enterprise sector in Ireland and the role that we will all play in shaping the future. Yeah, so from myself and Tammy, we'd love to thank the DRCD for inviting us. It's been a huge honour to play a small part in today's event. And for those of you catching the 347 train to Dublin, there are buses outside right now. So you want to get up quickly and uh, we want to wish you all a safe and pleasant journey home. Have a lovely safe day. Safe home everybody. Thank you. <laughs>